Chasing the Racing, powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 151, and we're delighted to be joined by Hudson Kenner. How are we doing? Thanks for having me, boys. Love, yeah, yeah, love the branding straight out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so what's all that about? And go for the next two hours. <laughs> no, we just, uh, just got Hudson's house, and uh, just in time for the Moto GP. Now, this podcast won't be going out for another week, so we'll, we'll be kind of like a week old, if you like, but what a, it was kind of good race, that one. Perfect timing when you boys turn up, on it? We got to watch the race, it was great. Yeah, it was really, really good. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, the um, other than the fact that if you just looked at the results, it might look like a pretty standard race. But other than, if Marquez hadn't uh, knacked the start, I don't know what happened there. Uh, maybe there's, there's that many electronics on them, but them things. Maybe he just didn't have mm. it in the right mode or whatever. But um, he lost so much time off the start, but then came back through. And I think he was probably only about three, four seconds off the win. Absolutely, yeah. So, he could have won it. We would have been in the battle for, for the... For the, for the win you know in the end definitely definitely. definitely. and I tell you what for the future of the show we've come up with an interesting concept between us essentially goggle box <laughs> for motorcycle races I think it'll be a good idea do you think do you lads think it could take off out of an, an, anyone that you know from racing who would you want to like watch watching MotoGP <sighs> I don't know, it'd be difficult because you, 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 oh, I don't know, you could end up in a scrap, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what we're aiming for, Michelle. There. No, but you, you came up with the perfect yeah. concept, though. You'd need someone from each different discipline, yeah, almost. Sure. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You'd need like a crew chief, and then, yeah. like, well, we've got two choices here stock thousand champions, and then you could get a classic race or all sorts, but you just yeah. need a bunch of a lot of wine, you know, some narcotics of some sort, and just really <laughs> spice it up, you know, just make it mental. I, like I said before, I think now Rusty's obviously hung his leathers up. There's such a dynamic with people pulling in different Chrissy was just worried about all the bits that he had on today so you can see he was pushing <laughs> pushing for he was he, he had no favourite it was just whoever he had money on <laughs> I, I, I tell you what this boy doesn't have any right he doesn't drink he doesn't he doesn't smoke no nothing I think you're a bit of a secret gap maths no, the, the connection's yeah, there definitely. he's works. trying to do the ratio that's, that's what he's trying to do yeah, yeah. he, he had a sprit bit on you just tell you it's about the maths <laughs> not about the money more GP fantasy league it's, uh, and I, t- I tell you what I was just checking out our league last night we've got like uh, getting on for 300 people in our league now and uh, there's a few now and again when you scroll through there's like some people put their actual name so you're like oh there's so and so but some are like uh, have it race and type thing mm. you don't know who they are but um, yeah I'd, 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 I'd quite happy with that race I had a few of the top 10 in so I can't complain I'd okay. just like to remind everyone it is a free entry to our fantasy league on this side of things so Brilliant. if you we'll just want to jump in go whoever, for it. whoever wins our fantasy league at the end of the year we'll do something special for them. maybe like have oh. them as a guest on the podcast or something oh, <laughs> there's an idea good, yeah. mind you no one, no one else will probably get a really shy timid person like what do you make of it just nothing for an hour. Nothing I know, just get hour. grilled by him. How did you work it out? Tell me, tell me. <laughs> yeah, you've done me <laughs> over. To be, to be fair, do you know, if, <laughs> so like out of that league, if the whoever wins, it does actually mean if they were putting like monetary bets on the choices that they took, they would be like massively up. In order to win out a league out of like two, like say 300 people, yeah, yeah. even like the top, the top like 10, 20 people would, would all effectively be making money if there were but, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's, a, bit, yeah, it's almost sure. like a good way of actually testing how because I, I think I know quite a bit about MotoGP but when you when you pick your favourites and you're watching like the nowhere <laughs> you kind of get a, a, a you know the firm realisation that you don't actually know as much as you think absolutely well this I think this year is also like wide open you know, we, we were talking about before the bike specs and yeah. just a little bit of what's came and like obviously picking on the Brad Binder story from a few rounds ago in the wet you know he could have won that the the story coming from his camp is that obviously they had a failure with the rear right arc, was stuck down the whole race. So Marquez had a failure today on the on yeah. the start, arguably cost him the win. Mm-hmm. And then Brad had that and his teammate won. So, you know, and, he, and he's in the same league the, as him in the They're looking, um, to, I think they're banning them from 2023, they're banning the changeable ride heights that are used on the straight. So they, they can keep them for the starting devices. Yeah. But, uh, for, well, I think Ducati were the first to use it, but now quite a few of the brands are, uh, where when the bikes get onto a straight, they drop by like a good few mil and obviously it's just less less air to go through so it's therefore yeah, yeah. more aerodynamic yeah. but um i think it's a me- is it a mechanical device or does it automatically come off when you hit the brakes when you hit the brakes it's been sort of made come off and that was the problem it didn't it didn't come off um for him that was the issue and, it, and then you can't release it so it's meant to automatically you, you set it and then it's all meant to automatically is, come is off. this detailed into the regs of uh, free tech are you allowed right <laughs> oh, are you allowed right height don't devices? you you joke we've had we already busted a team with shortening their, their dog bones on the, on one of their bikes on the suzuki's had to go around and you could see they were like homemade you're like those aren't original lads <laughs> 
<laughs> and then they got they got the original ones out the toolbox. You're like, come on. <laughs> you can see it was like that as well. Like they, they've been watching too much Moto GP. They, were like, they might have stamped rins on the side of it. Do you know what I mean? And we're like, oh, yeah, we got it from him. But they were, they were definitely trying to own. But it wasn't adjustable. It was just like a like a chopper. So what, what, no what, what is the best excuse you've heard? You know, for like a, like a team who's turned up, cheated. And oh. they're like, what is the best one-liner that you've heard? When we... we aborted like that. We, 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 <laughs> no, no, better than that. My, my mechanic... Uh, my mechanics it'll be okay <laughs> <laughs> no, no one's a mechanic on the team yeah, no, not... no he's not there but then you know him you know sort of heard his name but he's not he's definitely not around when they when they say that it's <laughs> like... now a lot of people that are listening to this might be familiar with your name from to be fair you've covered quite a lot of like different racing um the, you and know, the, world. the classes <laughs> and yeah and uh whether it's like from the road racing in the isle of man tt or from the short circuit with like the likes of bsb the classic stuff and obviously more recently the the free tech endurance race the no insurance endurance which has been a massive <laughs> so uh, phenomenon for the for british race and really it's something new that's came on the scene over the last few years and it's uh the popularity is like unbelievable so um i guess for anybody that's listening that isn't familiar, uh, do, do, where, where, where do you, where do you yeah, begin? Go from the start. Obviously, it's, you haven't got a, a local accent, so do you want to go from from there? Like, so you grew up in South Africa from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. My the backstory to me and the way I ended up over here was obviously motorbike racing. So yeah, I started motocross as a young kid. Can I interrupt you one second? Yeah. You have an opportunity to recreate yourself. Have you ever thought of that? I, I was just, I'm just could, thinking could about re, you, I could rewrite it. You no, could, right. couldn't you? I'm I still going to tell you about who I punched at TT. Then what? <laughs> All right, we'll get to that. That. Yeah, brilliant. But yeah, started started there. Just I don't know the the, the cute side of that was basically obviously in, in Af- South Africa the gardens are quite big. So I got a bike for a birthday um, because my dad you know wanted to spend less time with me probably at the at the time. And then my mom got angry because I destroyed the garden. And uh, yeah, I went to a racetrack uh, with him, and he was big into horse racing at the time and stuff. And it was quite funny. He picked a old Rover. He picked the bike at the back of the Rover, put it down. Kicked, he's quite a big guy. Kicked started it, was in his suit because he was going to the evening uh, horse racing and said, "Look, well, we're going to be finished here by three o'clock." And then there, w- there was races on that day. I'd bought a big green hood and helmet, got pictures from it, and that was my my first race on a JR fifty Suzuki, you know, the little Suzuki fifties. And um, yeah, it went from there. I, I sort of didn't shut up about it. I think I got a trophy in the post because we left like before the racing finished. Um, <laughs> Probably best trial. I fell off a few times, maybe a crash or something, and that was it. And then motocross till I was about early teens, and I crossed over. I showed you boys the, the bike earlier on uh, too. That was the first full size, which is essentially what the concept of free tech is now. So I've gone full circle. In those days, everything was two stroke. Got into that, and uh, yeah, started doing well. And then if I go through that, we where we we grew up. So myself, the likes of Cork Bellington, Shane Norville. Um, not not the Binders. Binders grew up inland, but basically all the coastal boys. Um, there's no racetrack for 450 miles. No, no actual circuit. So there's, there's there's ad hoc tracks that get licensed by our version of the ACU, and we did a lot of street racing. So we used to have like three quarters of our year was street racing, and and, then, and that's like road racing. Like yeah, yeah, racing, proper yeah. like like TT, but just a couple of miles, not you know 37 miles. So and and that little bike you saw, one of my early races in my first year. A marshal went to help her. another guy broke down the straight and got all the Harris fencing and he's f- fair sized marshal. So he tried to pick the bike, but as he picked the bike, he bent down and went right into the track and I was tucked down and moved across and it hit my, my hand and broke the clip on, but all, and he spun up and went in there. So all these crazy things used to happen. Lamp post with a, a hay bale strapped to it. There's loads of videos of, yeah, that of all that sort of stuff. So we, we was lucky. My mom videotaped most of it. So we got, I get to watch it back and think that's a crazy way to live your early teens. You know, so your, good. your first road race over here must be, this is really safe. Yeah. This, is, <laughs> this, this is for me. This feels like a British meeting. Well, so, so the, the, the story was a lot of good riders, um, you know, because we had the other thing about South Africa is the apartheid era. So there was a big ban, obviously until 1994, where uh, South African riders couldn't come over because of the international sporting rigs because they had apartheid, which obviously was like a racial oppression. So the first guys to come out was Shane after that ban was lifted. So there was actually a block where no one was allowed to travel, but like what's happening in Russia now, you know, with the yeah, Russian aye. athletes. So that athlete was, you know, probably a nice guy, but wasn't allowed to travel. So we actually had a pool of really good riders. And then my, my story of not having a racetrack near us, we used to drive hundreds of miles to the big tracks like we know in the UK, you know, you're... you're We've got Carl Army, you know, uh, Kilani, Swat Cups, loads of big tracks, East London. So all these ex Grand Prix tracks that all held Formula One races through the decades. We drive through the night. Our longest drive is 1,200 miles to our, wow. uh, to one of the national tracks. And the national series was about 10 rounds. That little bike, I think, used to have a five or six round 
50 cc national and you'd cover all those tracks so you do the, some of the short tracks and then the rest would be like long long tracks so that was like the the, the growth to that but you didn't know any different that was just normal That's that was, was just normal you didn't you didn't know about somewhere here where Donington where we're sitting now is what 10 miles down the road you know didn't exist what was diesel price back then like you know what I mean <laughs> Jesus imagine doing a 500 trip mile was, now you'd be like we're not going pe- we're petrol it. petrol's pretty yeah pre- <laughs> pretty cheap but still it's a huge huge trip that so yeah that's ridiculous and, and all this all the African so that's they've all had that do you know what I mean because even if you lived in land you might have had three or four racetracks but you would have traveled so like being on the road it wasn't really a big issue but you were still in your country where the, everything tasted the same you know there are differences but yeah so that was and then the Durban boys were a bit more hardy shall we say because of the the sort of you felt you're making more of a sacrifice and then when you got to a long track you took the opportunity because you couldn't go there on Tuesday or Wednesday to to practice and yeah so did all that and then um uh some of the early classic stuff so then we got one all the short tracks and then went to at the time the South African two two strokes. I did GP one two fives, but then two strokes faded out as it went. Everything went to four strokes, so sort of hindered everyone in that era's career because you had to change over. And I was just in that phase where it was wrong. So I went and rode some production RGV two fifties for a few years because we thought two strokes. I there was no thinking two strokes might come back. I don't know what what we thought. We just went and rode those because that's all we knew. Yeah. And um, you looked at a six hundred and you thought that's really big, you know. But actually, you the modern era you just jump on one you know yeah. um i think i was like 15 at the time so yeah and then uh when we got to 16 or 17 years old eventually went on to 600 suzuki went in my dad went and financed it as a delivery bike for his business as yeah. and um i took it with no license on we used to do so all the motorbike road riding is on breakfast runs so everyone meets at a, the bike shops and it goes on an out ride but it's a it's a unauthorized road race where they know but the problem so i got my ass handed to me the first time when i because well luckily i came back because a few of the boys were a bit you know sketchy <laughs> and this was meant to run the bike and i came i said i'll never be good at this because i got drilled by all these road guys you know, on the thing but they knew they knew the roads those back roads but yeah literally came back and um went up to a race um a few weeks later the national at uh, carl army it was the first round and uh, no testing like that nonsense got there and the clock of the course the scrutiny scrutiny as a bike runs away doesn't give us a stick it says or be around clock of the course comes up and says you, it's all been race prepped by the dealership yeah and they said uh, you, you can't ride that lad I said why and he goes it's got road tires on <laughs> we turned up with the the oem road tires on to to because there were pirellis or you know a brand yeah. whatever comes on the bike he says that you have to run one of these you know there were brands options but you had to run one of these three brands and not not that and that's a road tire well that's oh, can't he just go and do a few a few laps on it like that no no and you have to change he trudges off to the <laughs> Dunlop garage or the Prelly garage gets a set of tires put on. So the standard silencer. Anyway, went on road and uh, was did all right. Did, was I think the field was like thirty five, so like top boys, and oh, I think I was like inside the top thirty. And they're getting better. And he said, "Well, if you do such such laps, I'll buy you an N can." Was a bloke selling an arrow N can? <laughs> the, the, Incentive is there. It. Yeah, and then so the, the 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 reason for those stories is that basically when you don't know, you know, it's quite funny that when you get to stage now. We, you know, knowledge is quite strong, you know, especially in my career, you, you quite knowledgeable about, about motorcycles. And I was very technically knowledgeable. I always worked in the trade. I did motorcycle engineering, so I knew how to rebuild stuff. But I, obviously, you didn't, you didn't know what was with my tires earlier. You didn't know my tire technology. You know, you just saw one and another. So yeah. that was it. And then, yeah, the, the uplift, the, the quick version of that story is uh, in that year, the top Suzuki rider got injured. And I, I eventually finished third on our bike at one of the rounds at Fakisa the, at the MotoGP track. On our bike and Suzuki came and said, "This chap's injured. We'll support you the rest of the year, and uh, basically help fund and a little bit so you know you don't even know about. Basically, you could run that six hundred. And then at the end of the year, I was in a factory Suzuki team that ran two. It was like a young development team. And um, throughout that year, we did better and better. And I think I, I won around. And then the next year, the rules changed because that was the premier class was six hundreds. And next year they. That they had one more year of 600s after that, and I won quite a few races. But the Yamahas were winning everything, and the year after that, they went to thousands, which was 2004. And I won every single race on the thousands on the Suzuki. I won, I won every race, barring the first race, which I won on track, but I lost because that stopped the race somewhere through. And on the technicality, I lost it, but basically, won every single race against like Sheridan, Marias, those guys were all, yeah, all racing, and then. Suzuki funded us to go overseas. And the other, the other interesting part is you used to get paid. When you won, you got paid. Those days, I'd make £3,000 a weekend in 2004. Is that like converted? It's converted. Wow. 
and it literally because what had happened was the because of what had happened in the nineties, the manufacturers had all really it had all been focused internally, yeah. and the riders had been focused internally. And what actually started happening was. Everyone says that you shouldn't have an argument with someone. Well, there's two reasons for a, not, not an argument, but that sort of rivalry. Yes. You know what I mean? But that rivalry drives two things. It drives your team and your sponsors. Yeah. Because if you walk around really, really friendly with everyone, if Ducati love Yamaha, not going to put all the effort in, are they? So no. the manufacturers had a, a long history. All the MDs of all the manufacturers, like, obviously went to conferences together, but secretly, how could they beat each other? It wasn't, they didn't care about the golf course. They needed their jockeys to do the job. And we'd had a, a lot of money from cigarettes uh, before when my, when my two-stroke era was around, the, the top guys were getting paid at, like Winston and, and these cigarette companies still exist, um, and Marlboro and all the rest of it. But then it changed to um, mobile phones. So we had the likes of Vodafone, it was called Vodacom there, Celsius, so all those new technologies came in, took up their home with the finances. So we the, the teams had an unlimited budget. There were stock bikes, there were super stock rigs, basically. Yeah. Um, but we had like um, all the suspension from from Europe and the Corona team at the time. So is that essentially like they the, wouldn't be popular? A, a BSB but South Africa superbikes. Yeah, but if you like. no electronics, so still standard electronics. Yeah. So like European Superstock was at the time. And, and does that um, is it mainly riders from South Africa, or does it attract riders from the rest of Africa? So the only the, we there was a contingent of like Australians used to come over. It was a bit Southern Hemisphere led, but right. there was um, in the in the six hundred days just before. I was around, but just before my time, there was the, um, I think it was like a transatlantic challenge. So they had British riders come over, yes. they had um, Australian riders, and that, and what used to happen, there was so much money that the factory teams would would literally, if you if it was today, because mm -hmm. he would come come from the UK and say he's, he's on BMW, and the, you know, there was no BMWs then, but it was BMW Aye, team. For example. The factory team, he'd be he'd get given one bike, you know, he, he'd be given, you choose your bike, and you'd literally go, I'll have that one. And they were the same. So then the factory rider, would would have so it'd be all well, spare bikes and then they'd race for you know a decent amount of prize money and that's what yeah what was the prize money then, then? yeah it was still strong it was before it was it was stronger than than that three thousand pounds it was mm -hmm. I mean it, everything was paid as well like your whole trip everything was all so you had a free holiday as well on so top of in terms of um, <laughs> and so cigarettes you sort, yeah. of, you sort of late teens early twenties was yeah. that was that a career for you or were you just kind of, were kind of making a little bit on the side with the racing yeah well, up until until I went sort of pro with Suzuki there was there was no income and it was all yeah. you know dad funded so to speak and my dad my family was middle income so we. We had, you know, what did your dad do for a living? He owned, um, he owned an automatic, or well, he owned a gearbox company for cars back then. So he he trained in America and come back and before really? he had me, and that was quite a, he was in quite a unique position really, and and he had quite a, quite a strong business from that. So he was mechanically minded, but mm. he never he used to help. Obviously, the racetrack he was fully involved, but with the two strokes like that one you saw there, we sent it off to you know the two stroke gurus and they'd rebuild it, but he'd fit it back in and mm -hmm. make sure the brakes and everything were fine. You and know. at this time, do you know, when you were say, like when you, for example, when you started winning on the thousands in yeah. South Africa, right then, were you, did you have eyes on sort of World Superbikes eventually or be, did, were you thinking BSB or? Yeah, well, well yeah, so, sorry. No, 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 yeah. sorry, no, I was just about to say, how apparent was BSB at this time? Yeah, all of you know, that stuff, like, well, it was, it was quite, it, it was it was this unique sort of overlap where it's not motorcycle racing as we've known in the last decade certainly and and it was a bit of a you didn't realize how good you had it at the time i mean you obviously with the bank balance just going up vertical all the time you if you're winning i know i had that really good year and even the year before we won some races you want a bit of a retainer i mean you'd get yeah you get loads of stuff from them for free but what suzuki did to answer that question is they had a world cup at end of every year and um, in 2004, five and six, they basically took their their riders to to their World Cup all all around the country, all around the world. Sorry, so the first year talking about PSB, this will link into the rest of our stories. Was in um, I think the first year was Many Corps in in France. So again, you've done well. There was, I was still I was I hadn't won the championship then. I'd done quite well in the 600s, and they raced 750s because Suzuki were obviously big on the Jixxer 750. So we got to um, Many Corps, and I met the likes of Steve Brogan. He was he was the 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 British uh, one of the British riders. I think um, uh, Ben was there as well um, from uh, Kelling Rider. Ben, ben was Wilson. Ben Wilson. Yeah, he was there. I'm trying to think. So there was the British contingent, but then you had, you know, the, uh, and it was like I was the single guy from South Africa, but it, like they had like a three man British team. I don't I can't remember the third guy was in that three man French team, three man Italian team. So stack grid, and then you arrived then Suzuki just had all these, you know, prepared race bikes, but stuck and. You just got your number and a key, and they were all the same. So yeah, it was and Michelin tires and all that. So we knew what it was before. So we'd done a bit of testing, 
uh, on the tires and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, it was freezing. It was the end of the year, freezing cold, many corner. I didn't make. I'm literally. I think I qualified second row, so like top six or something. But I pulled off and didn't make the warm up lap. Crashed. There's two races. Thank goodness. But I crashed as I went into the left on a warm up lap because Mitch, old, new Michelin, but Michelin's without. Yeah, yeah. And we sat there forever. No warmers. Plus in South Africa, my, my and the, and my whole crew had come. So like your whole the whole team had flown out with you. So we we were on, we were doing really well because you know. Um, where we were and uh fell off the way, mended the bike and then the next race i think i finished third overall so me and me and steve had a massive battle so it was the first and then the, if you look back through my career someone like steve like I've, but we like raced against each other like from then to like when when we both retired you know the whole time so it was quite cool but yeah that was that was year one at many course so yeah and then you earn some dough look not make it but there was more of the experience but from that so that was suzuki were really pushing forward then the next year was america road atlanta and um I did well there. I finished third overall. I think I finished in the top three of all the races. But Javier uh, Fores was in. He won that. So he was he and we was close though. And there was one it was me, Javier, and a Yank. I can't remember the Americans' name, but we were like the ones battling. And then the next year was the Jixa European Cup, and um, I'd won. So it was two thousand five, and then that went in line with the World Superbikes. So they had five rounds or six, five yeah four or five rounds with them. So it was. I can't remember all the rounds, but it was basically Valencia, uh, Imola, uh, Imola, Mizano, uh, Manicor, and there was one in Germany. So it's four or five rounds. And um, yeah, I raced that. So And then I raced in Africa as well because we were still earning dough there. And then I, I won that championship uh, in 2005. And, and then, so until then, it was like a fairy tale scenario and, and heavily funded. So, like, the main moral of that story is that. Without Suzuki and what they were doing, and and Suzuki South Africa, because they were, you know those the, the air flights, you can't just I couldn't drive. I mean, as much as you know, it was impossible. So everything was being funded, and still a reasonable salary. But you could also tell that the the scene in South Africa was starting to to sort of equal out to what was probably happening in the rest of the world. If you know mm-hmm. what I mean, but you 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 didn't know. Yeah. And the mistake you make is that you think, well, that might be dropping off, but then you know of BSB and stuff like that. And uh, the the probably one of the turning points, the sort of not sour, but one of the the chip on your shoulder points where you get another one is because um, I'd won that. I I qualified for a free ride with um, All Star Corona, or the All Star team in their Super Stock. So I uh, we that was like you know celebrated. We went to Troy Corsa won the World Championship that year. So we were at the party with them. We'd won at Mini Core. We had all the big wigs from Suzuki there, all the big wigs from this. We had this massive party. Went to Valencia testing. Bike was like. Strangely, a lot better than my standard bike from South Africa, but like the clutch was better and little things you're thinking was meant to be the same, you know what I mean? But anyway, it was way, way better. And on that testing sheet, it was a bit damp. And at Valencia, I was in the Superbike for testing and we were in the same group. And I was like top 10 on that stock bike and because of, of the conditions, not because mm-hmm. the ride was good, but the whole thing played out. And then we got summoned to a meeting uh, that afternoon or after the two day test, or whatever it was. And they said, You've got a problem because my birthday was in January. I was too old before the season started. Oh. And that, and they said you can't ride superstock. And they, the the way the team was set up was, I think they had um, Foray in the six hundred, and then they had Troy and Yuki in the the mm. bigger bikes. And it was just, it was just taken away. I think we got some money, and and that was it. So I had nothing. So basically, done had this like massive ascent, all this help, and and you know, no one to blame either because it was just a, a rule. A technical. No, and no one thought we'd win either. You know what I mean? Like there were some good riders. I mean, yeah, there's some good riders from that championship that went on to ride in World Superbike after after the Spanish guys did. Or they didn't win World Championships, but they all raced in Superbike. And, and do you know when you were coming over to racing like the European yeah. C- Cup and stuff, were you still based in South Africa and just travel on feet around? Yeah, only because I was still racing. Oh. So the next year, the 2006 year, I was I was going to leave uh, South Africa to... Um, to, to go to race in Europe or to stay in Europe. And mm-hmm. I was remember being at one of the last rounds looking at some um, motorhomes and the big RVs and stuff and going, oh, cause you didn't, you, again, you didn't get that in South Africa either. You just go in a van. I, mean, I had a 1600 Nissan pickup or something. And I just drive to race me, whatever was cheapest because of the fuel scenario in the distance, you know? And then even when I was like a, a, a factory rider, I'd rather drive than fly because they pay your mileage and you make a few coin off that. So you drive, you just drive the thousand miles just to, just to earn a couple of quid extra in your car. Hudson, and, you're taking a while. Yeah, I'm taking the long the way. The long way, yeah, yeah. It was all Swimming through the mountains. down the motorway and get the mileage. And so when, yeah. that, when that ride dropped through, I guess you'd had your eyes opened up to the European scene. Mm. Did, did you did you manage to secure another ride like over here? Yeah, so what, what happened was it, at, at the crossover there was... I'd, um, met I'd met in South Africa uh, the likes of Johnny Towers but the way I met Johnny was quite a good cool story we're at Cape Town 
and um, the normal black BSB where you've got the uh, where you've got the uh, a tape across the front of the pits and it was a really windy day really clear but really windy anyway you had all the guys outside they're in pit lane like a pit lane walk and all asking questions and um this one chap was was asking loads about the corner called dams where the wind gets under the bike and we're talking about that and he had like intimate knowledge of the pumps and i was like basically crying about the bumps and the wind and all the rest of it on the thousand and uh this eventually the, the one in the kanks walked over and knew him and so they th introduced and all the rest of it. but i still had no idea of the the uk scene and that was probably a year before this had all gone wrong. So when it had gone wrong, I was talking to lots of people. I was saying, well, what do I do next year? And uh, he said, listen, let me put some feelers out in the UK. And, and basically, he sets up the deal with Steve Rogers and myself, um, you know, off, off the back of nothing, if that makes sense. And, and to be fair, Steve was doing nothing at the time, you know, as well. So, yeah, he was the catalyst for it to happen. He said, well, initially, we're going to go Suzuki on our own. We're going to just do it. You know, there was a bike shop or whatever down here. And then... I think he was up at Steve selling him some leathers or something, and uh, they started chatting around. Steve said, oh, I wouldn't mind. But the only difference was I had to ride an R1, which, yeah, I, I didn't mind the R1, but because I'd raced against it a lot, I sort of had an opinion that the Suzuki was was still better, you know. Mm -hmm. So, But it was after chatting and, and looking at it, it was like it was much easier to do it that way, or much much more. I, I do remember Steve Rogers talking about it, but I couldn't really remember the story. So did you yeah. come over? As, you were staying in his yard, weren't you? Yeah. Racing Superstar. Yeah. So there was, Well, yeah, there was the... the, the, the the story to that was a couple of things before I got to his yard. Basically, I I knew I knew sort of Steve's Steve's Fleet story. Wars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I knew a bit about them, and, and I spoke to Steve. But Steve, I mean, seen pictures, but the point was, remember, there's no social Facebook. I think was brand new then, so there wasn't like it was today. You know, well, well, 2006. I was about to say, what, what time period are we talking from here? From like you know years of like my like schoolboy motocross. Yeah. Straight over all this, yeah. earning miles by swerving your car down the motorway, and yeah, then yeah. The, and yeah. I, I've got to ask you a question, like. Coming from South Africa, what was the opinion of BSB? Like, looking back at that time, was it like, oh, all right, this is going to be a piece of piss? Or was yeah. it, this is a hard championship? Or, you know, what was the opinion at that time? No, I mean, BSB was definitely, you know, everyone knew about BSB. We didn't get it on TV, so that was probably the one the one bit that we didn't get. But we, basically, if, you, if in, <laughs> from when I started probably in the 90s to, well, mid-90s to early, early 90s to then, I had like a subscription for performance bike and three and probably motorcycle news, I think. And I used to go and pick it up every week. One mm -hmm. was monthly, one was weekly. I used to go every week to the same news agents and it cost a fortune. And my mom used to go mad and I used to, you know, read through this this Brit, the British uh, newspaper, uh, magazines. And that was the only, you know, factual communication you had. You knew the guys because they were changing over and you were watching World Superbikes and they were talking about the crossover and who was riding. And so there was always this chat. And obviously you knew... You know, you're talking to people that had been there and done that. So we had a lot of South African guys who had then gone over before, like in mm. the, when they were allowed. There was windows when they were allowed in the 80s, and then and we're talking about the British tracks and how they and they were really young there. They were like 16, 17, and sort of came back in their 20s, and now we're like 40 or late 30s, 40. So there was like that chat going on, and then obviously Johnny and Steve not convinced me, but I was. It was a, it was a clear option, and it was a, it was a clear winner. The only negative is that my mindset was that I'm going to go there. And then get back to where I was. That's what I mean. And yeah. that was probably, in hindsight, through the next couple of years, you didn't really appreciate. Well, so we were earlier how you didn't appreciate what you were doing as as much as you should have. And also, everything from a finance point of view was obviously completely different. You know, because you were just starting again essentially, and that was a bit of a pill to swallow. So that's where, you know, sometimes you were, I was probably more frustrated than I should have been. And when you first came over uh, with Steve Rogers, was it a case, did you have a sponsor that you, were you like bringing budget or were they? No, it was, it was literally, I think we had 10 grand from, from, spon from genuine sponsors. Um, and then he was providing the parks and everything. And then I said, I'd provide a mechanic, which I had lined up someone to come with me from South Africa, which never ended up never happening. So we then he we then inherited one of the chaps from the shop, which was fantastic. Um, but he said, "Will you build the bikes yourself and stuff?" And I and I I could we you know had been actively involved, but I'd been given I was building all my own stuff, barring my race bikes, if that makes sense. So yeah. we knew how to put put something together. And then um, but it's a bit difficult when they, they gave me a brand new R one. I'd never stripped an R one before, so you're trying to find all the little plastic legs and road bikes are nightmare. So once we got through that. Uh, but yeah, I had, I had the space where they currently work now with that mm -hmm. factory teamers in that workshop. And 
yeah, had my own little section and we just cracked on. But the, the funny story on the way to Steve's before before I ever laid eyes on him, we spoke loads of times on the phone and lined it up and, he, you know, he, he's, his favorite is drive, everything's drive, yeah, drive. So I started saying this Africa. People were like, what are you saying? You know, where's this drive? What is this? Because that's slang that no one's ever heard, you know, there. Because <laughs> I was picky enough from talking to him. But anyway, on the way to his, I, I landed and I was at, had no one yet. Johnny was in Cape Town. So I went to Johnny's house, spent seven days. He went and got a van similar to your boys from Astro, Astro Van Center, Stu, went and bought one from him. Bought a caravan from a, a mate of a, a friend of a friend here. When I collected the caravan, drove straight to um, Steve's place. So on the way to Steve's place, it was I was going over the tops near your neck of the woods, and uh, it was snowing and sleeting. I had my shorts on, flip flops, and a t-shirt, <laughs> and I had the heating on full tilt on this Vita. You know, driving along, driving. I'm thinking, and everyone's telling me every day I'll be warmer soon. Don't worry. And I'm thinking soon means like there's a cold front. It'll be tomorrow. <laughs> means like, this is like February. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe late January. So like <laughs> driving along all the way there. And I get to if, if you go into Fito, it's got the most roundabouts in the whole world. Eventually, it became fun, but when you're trying to get there and if, and and South Africa there's not lots of roundabouts, so it's like confusing. Then you get there, you like, <laughs> you got this caravan, you're swaying through anyway, sway through <laughs> the fourth or fifth one, and there's this policeman on a motorbike sitting there in the rain, and it, it stops snowing by the time you get there because you're near the coast, but definitely snowed your your side of the, of the world. <laughs> and um, got this policeman like looked at me, said, "I thought, oh, what's he looking at?" Just, and it wasn't the way it was going very quick because you're still converting your head miles and kilometers and all that nonsense. Anyway, um, next round I get to about ten of the blokes jump out, oh, move up, put, like pull you over so I swerve pull over anyway one the window down guy comes out says I need to step out the vehicle so I jump out into a puddle flip flops feet straight into this freezing cold puddle just looking down I think it's raining the guy looks at just takes one look at me and says what are you doing yeah I said oh I'm going to Steve Rogers this and that he goes have you nicked this I said <laughs> I said, no. so I've got all my paper. I obviously just bought everything over the last three days. I've got all my paper. I'm showing him everything. I'm like, he's like, oh, no, but whatever. You've definitely nicked this, haven't you? I'm like, no, no, I've not. He said, I said, I said, no, no. I said, is it not taxed? So I'm not. He's talking about the caravan now. He's moved on to the caravan. I said, yeah. I said, because I've shown him the tax disc. And I had to do all this stuff that we we do there. But obviously, like in South Africa, you don't have to cars and shit. That's not a, a forced thing. So did all that nonsense. And uh, he's on about this caravan. I'm like, what are you about the caravan? I said. I said, no, I've just picked it up. I said, he has the receipt for it. I paid four and a half grand for it. And I said, listen, it, you know, yeah. it's a it's a it's a dear thing. Because it also looked at the time, it was old now, but it looked nice then, you know. <laughs> so uh, he goes, he carries on and he goes to drags you to the back. And I'm walking in a flip-flop t-shirt, shorts, raining and freezing, holding myself. He points at the number plate and he goes, he goes, What are you trying to prove by this? I said, I'm still looking. I said, What's the problem? He goes, anyway, this exchange happens about four times. He goes, it's not the same. I said, should they be? <laughs> I didn't know number plates in South Africa don't have to be the same. Your your trailer in South Africa has a tax disc. So you don't oh, need so, separate. so he thought because the number plates are different, I just hooked someone else's caravan up and started driving away with it. <laughs> so anyway, he then he then twigged or the five of them that were trying to arrest me, then twigged that uh, I wasn't talking nonsense. And they said, Oh, we've just done a bike day at Steve's place, uh, rider training thing about a week ago or whatever. I said, oh, okay. They said, I said, well, I'm only like two miles away. I said, yeah, we'll we'll show you. We'll show you. Don't worry. So there's three of them right in front of the, the van. Yeah. Although, but again, I'm still thinking they don't. Police escort. Yeah. <laughs> Please, they, I'm still thinking these boys don't believe me. You know what I mean? There's no ways they believe. Because why is there three of them? Anyway, as we get to Steve's shop, if you've ever been there before, it's on the uh, sort of like on the, on the prom. Cool, uh, and you turn in. And you turn and then you turn like right into the shop and the car park's there. But obviously, I'd never been before. So I'm following them. Next thing, they all turned the sirens and lights on and drove into the car park with all the sirens and lights blazing. And I turned up like in the middle of the car park, blocking everything with this like semi old Vito and not too bad looking caravan. How to make an entrance, sir? <laughs> exactly. And he's got to go. So, and then Steve wheeled himself out, comes out, driver, driver. And then I jump out, flip flops, t shirts, the line. And he goes, You're not going to last long. Yeah, driver, if you keep dressing like that. <laughs> And that's that's the first time we laid eyes on each other, so it was quite good. Yeah. And then he, then yeah, the rest is history. Parked up around the side and uh, through, slung a slung a cable through the door, and that was it. And then yeah, then, then a few weeks later, we went testing in Spain, and yeah, it was all it was all. Did you get on okay on the old one? Yeah, the old one. I think that I think Brendan right at the shop. You had everything you wanted. If you wanted an impact gun, you weren't working in a hovel. You know, you everything was was pucker, and it just that that whole situation, the weather, no no team, no no team there, and then the um, and then the race, the way it went, obviously getting like, beat up, basically, you know. Did you have any more funny run-ins that year with, like, either people in the paddock or, uh, like, other riders? Or Yeah, a little. I think the, the first year, because um, I obviously you had, like, the Southern contingent, so we all sort of, like, secretly hate each other because of the, the way you want to beat an Aussie or uh, another Southern. Hemisphere. Like that. Yeah, it's, it's what, well, definitely in... 
it sort of carries over from natural sport because if when you go to school in in the southern hemisphere definitely south africa and australia you you in the school term when there's rugby it's like okay so you've chosen rugby what's your other subject what's your other sports subject you're choosing and and then obviously it's so focused that that then takes your mind right into the international so you then you've never met an australian before but you naturally just don't like them in new zealanders if that makes sense because <laughs> yeah, yeah. because there's that rivalry you know what i mean and it's it's lesser so with the, the northern hemisphere but yeah that was sort of the, the brendan was winning loads of stuff so not, not a run per se with him but we we went and did sort of um, some work in motor directors like laborers and, and building showrooms and stuff. And we, you know, we had great crack, but then you go to the next race meeting and he'd do really well. So that was, wasn't really running. I mean, I remember how he main wearing uh, lost. So the second race we finished I was on the, on the front row and then it rained at Donington and I just, I, I didn't fall off, but I just rode in a dead straight line slowly because it was wheel spinning down the straights. And I just said, I don't know anyone, Roger. And again, like another, but it qualified quite well, like front row or second row. So that had fixed that that sort of issue. Bike was getting good. And then I won Thruxton, which was the third round. But me and Howie had quite a big dash then. And, and Howie, he was a bit inconsistent at the time, still a young lad, but he was really wild. So on the racetrack, he was like sticking elbows into you. And I mean, he was wild his whole way through his career, but then he was like exceptionally wild, especially when you could see exceptionally wild, the, the, the win. You know, we were battling, there was three or four of us battling for the win. So it was quite quite the same but all the races all those early races there were two two practice sessions two qualifying sessions to get through and i think only by around four or five did it actually get to a stage where there was back to one one qualifying session so yeah it was a, it was a it was a very very deep year you know with if you made an error and then the likes of alton park you know i, I went into the and cadwell those tracks are like very unique you can't everyone you know it doesn't really make sense because you probably did something there before as a as a rider but if you've never rode then you get there or even if you did a track day you think oh, i know where i'm going and then you get there and you're with other lads who are you know super fast it's like next level and when i watched the 600s there it was carl crutchlow laverty sykes they were all um yeah all, all at the top of their game just a touch of different story back in south africa we did a a few endurance races at the end of the years and tom sykes came out to be my teammate because he was riding for tess yeah and again i i Obviously, he was only a 600 rider then, but he was quite handy. And I remember turning up to the track after a big, like, not a, not a bender the night before, but I came up in a veto <laughs> and I brought like 20, like 10 people up with me because, again, we drove 450 miles. So we were going up for the day, for the day, we'll race and then have a party that night. So then all my all my mates and, you know, loads of people, I remember just someone else drove me up. I slept in the back and uh, we got there on race day and Tom had been practicing for a few days. And yeah, they race, oh, it's like, you know, I don't know what the lap times were, but it was really, really fast. Obviously, he was a fast lad, and it was like, and then it was like, oh, let's get going. And we, 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 between us, we won. And then obviously, there was a, him, he had come out, and Cal had come out. It was a, there was a, there was a whole load of lads that came out and rode diff with at different teams. And again, a bit like it was in the old days, but more sort of the track had put it on this time than, than the um, federation, so to speak. But yeah, that was a, another great story. Was it in your first season at BSB? Was there one rider that pulled up on the grid with you and you thought, ah, Fuck and oh, I don't want to be anywhere near you. Brogy was in the Brogy, Brogy was on the yeah. start every time, and not because he does anything wrong, just because he's a hard he's a hard nut, isn't he? You know what I mean? Like and <laughs> he's just saying, oh, and he'd all, he'd all, and he'd always be competitive. He never had a, a bad race. You know what I mean? So it was like really. So you mean sort of nemesis? Yeah, all the way through. I mean, later in 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 our racing, we we had more even. Because the the field, like when we got to Evo in two thousand ten, that we we racing each other the whole year. We were the two fastest guys with two fastest teams, so we say. And um, yeah, that was that was a hell of a thing. So it was funny that you think all the way back to France, and we had a big battle then, you know. And was just, so and, it, and then obviously that first year he was in the Nvidia team, I think, and on R one. So yeah, lots of people that like you started having these bonds, but not for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? But, Great, yeah. And you obviously mentioned when you first came over that uh, Johnny Towers played a big part in the initial sort of setting up the the deal with Steve Rogers. Yeah. And for those people that don't uh, know who Johnny is, he's obviously the the co is a co founder of RST and yeah. Motor Direct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a, like a good friend of yours. Now, when you first came over, other than putting you in touch, did you did you uh, go and work for Johnny straight away? And like, what was the what was the connection? There? I, I just worked basically. All I did is um, I had to prep the bike. So so by the third round, uh, before that, when at Thruxton, or, no, after the win at Thruxton, Steve then went all in, and he you know money was no object from a a facility point of view. So he bought the lorries, bought everything we had. We had you know we had mechanics, we had stuff, people from the shop. He was rotating stuff. It was tough because obviously, if you imagine then that, that everything was really busy. You know, it's pre the the sort of financial crash so everything was really on a high so 
if you think about it, to compromise the business was quite a big thing and, mm. and he injected a lot of cash into it. So from that point on, Steve sort of took the reins. And then what I did is um, I used to work either in the shop if I wasn't doing anything, whatever that would be, go and fetch a bike or go help out in any way I could. But obviously, if you think about it, we I would still be tasked to do everything on those bikes. So if we came back, I'd do the clean, the prep, get it back ready. So I was full-time running that team, which obviously I rode for, but I was hands-on with that. So it was the it was the one time we didn't have it. But what I did manage to do, I said to you before, we always sort of worked in, in amongst it, other than having that sort of um, job, which was a was part of the deal, shall we say, you know, you couldn't say, oh, I want an extra 30 grand to, to drive that van, Steve, it wouldn't, wouldn't have gone down well. And to no. be fair, you know, what he was doing at the time, it was second to none. But what I did manage to do was um, a lot of sort of seconds, motorcycle clothing and started and then discovered eBay and sort of trading in that. And, and yeah, we had a, a good year, I think selling, you know, sort of all, all riding jackets and stuff that they weren't you know, end of line and all that sort of stuff. So that became an income because I needed something else because that was a big issue or side point for me. Not that I had something that I needed to fund, but it was something I'd always done in the past. Okay. And that was, and then that led on, that was probably the only restriction with being that involved in the racing mm -hmm. that you, your time was restricted. But it was also, again, you didn't appreciate how lucky you were. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there thinking, I never regretted prepping the bikes. That was always good, but it was just like, I wish that we, it was, you know, something yeah. more. You know, and was, yeah. Was that linked with Trick Motor, or was that part? Of no, that was that was before the Trick Motor thing. Eventually, that came in. That was just a brand that Motor Direct developed with another with um other goods that they sold, basically. Yeah. So yeah. so Trick uh, Motor Direct in the end, well, for a long time, always did AGV, developed RST, was their in-house brand. Obviously, Ara, um, Trick Motor became a brand that they they developed. They've got Wolf Clothing. Um, what motocross wolf clothing no the uh, the, 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 oh, the leathers yeah. 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 so so it's, it's, Scotland that. yeah it's two <laughs> two different wolves yeah but that's a another brand that they've always been involved in so yeah those and the motor obviously they did motor so yes, those are their their core brands so um, yeah they always did lots of those but when I first met Johnny then RST like no one in BSB BSB rode with RST and now you know you've got people in world championships riding with it so I just I just as soon as the leathers fitted me okay you know they were good from the beginning i never actually had an issue with any suit then i i just jumped on board and that was it wasn't about because of where i was i was a, a big fish in a small pond before so i came over already as like an rst rider but not thinking about it but then when we started doing quite well and then with the the image that steve allowed the team to portray was obviously it was it was really good for all the brands involved and and it, and, and then and then steve obviously lends on yamaha and those days, you know, the manufacturers put in, I know they put in money now, but mm -hmm. comparatively then it was a huge amount of money. Now, what, um, obviously, I know we mentioned it before, and uh, people are familiar that, that you went over to the Aleman TT. Where mm -hmm. does that kind of fit into the timeline? Yeah, so I did three years uh, in, I did a couple of years, three years in Superstock, and then the fourth year I rode Super, Super Sports. And I was talking to the guys at uh, Paul Phillips and the boys that run the TT. They'd come over and see me a few times. And um, yeah, it was, it, I was a fan because, again, going back to VHS, we had all the Duke videos from from the TT and all the history, and we had the ten video sets, and we'd watched all that sort of stuff. And my my surname is from the Isle of Man, so that the at some stage five generations ago, four generations ago, they were um, my my family's Manx, so on well, my dad's side. So the point is, right? Um, yeah, my mom's my mom's family is from Cornwall, because obviously, if you think about it, most people in most. Uh, White people in in Africa have obviously immigrated there from somewhere else. So mm. over time, you know, if you think of the settlers came in seventeen hundreds or whatever, sixteen hundreds. So the point is that it was after that. But um, yeah, everyone settled there. So that was a, a, a strange dynamic. That you look back into the history, and it was, it, I think, it was his his great grandfather was uh, was was actually born on the Isle of Man, and then came here, and then went got a boat to Africa. So when you were in South Africa, who was your racing hero then? You know, growing up thinking, oh, yeah, my and I. I Easy, Wayne Rainey was my my guy. Yeah, but anyone on the roads element was that uh, me growing Rhodes, up looking at watching it on telly? Yeah, and... roads was like sort of. I think it was Joey was probably that was later on was when we sort of getting involved in it. But the the videos I watched was all Hellwood. So like yeah. it, like if you said obviously he had already passed, but you know from but the thing is if you looked at that Hailwood was it was Hailwood and then you had Agostini battles and all that. That was that was the VHS we watched and then we were getting the the live results. But that was like for us although. It was when it got slightly newer because it covered it from you know way back when when it first started. But the newer stuff was was only a few years out of date, if you see what I mean. So yeah. it wasn't massively out of date. And then we were still getting the results. And yeah, the roads 
we didn't know about the Northwest 200 stuff like that. That wasn't as a problem. But the Isle of Man was was it's it's we were talking before a little bit, but it's unbelievable how big it is. Like you, you can, it, I know I've not done it, but what I'm saying is, even as a kid, motorcyclists knew about the Isle of Man in a continent far away. That's they don't know about MotoGP to that level. You know what I mean? And then yeah. they also start to know about those big names from the past. And if you if you were to say John McGuinness now in a in a, a bikers pub in South Africa, ninety nine percent of the people would would know. Or in a breakfast run, you know, the cub cub stop, you, they would all know him. So you know, it's and they've and they've, it doesn't get fed live. It's not a live show. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's just a, it's trickled down through he, TV networks. He, obviously, it's going live this year. It'll be yeah, interesting yeah. to see how that sort of transcends in, huge, internationally. Yeah, I think it'll be a big that'll be a big step because the the problem you've got is going off topic of motorbikes, the problem with TV packages in, in foreign countries is not unless it's a core sport mm -hmm. that they've put on the back burner. So if you yeah. think about it, that, that those days especially, I mean, it's changed a little bit now with stream, but pre-streaming, if you think about it, you're paying subscription like a version of Scar. Yeah. But if they only cater to their market, so if your market for motorcycles is smaller, that's what they're going to cater for. You know, yes. we still got 500cc GP. That was still live, but bef like, in the 80s early 90s we would get our national series would be live do you know what i mean that like and then that stopped sort of stopped happening in the early 2000s then we'd have a package that was shown later do you see what i mean so yeah. everything evolved onwards so it's it was it's hard to cover if it's covered in and obviously tt is a great show you know what i mean it's a it's a it's the it's the, the spectacle race. doesn't actually need selling as a Absolutely. package it Absolutely. sort of sells itself it doesn't need the fireworks from kota and all that sort of stuff. It, it, it literally it, it's got all the glamour anyway and yeah. and the if you watch it you, you're blown away and if you if you're an average motorcyclist that it, it connects with you straight away because you've all ridden down a road no, a little bit too fast the tv moment. coverage will never replace being track side, being sure. roadside but hopefully it'll bring are you on the committee crowd. now for the tt or something you're selling this beautifully Chris. Yeah, i'm a big fan <laughs> yeah, of your work uh, yeah. hopefully well, it'll bring in a new, new absolutely uh, do you know how powerful tv is do you know um the old top gear series where yeah, they used yeah. to go on like they would go on like trips like to like app like the just middle of nowhere yeah. they would be driving through there and people would come out of like mud huts with no electricity or whatever jeremy clarkson jeremy yeah. and like they would like they be know. going mad for jeremy yeah. clarkson that's, that, that's how it would be for for like mcginnis or the top tt guys there's been a little <laughs> bit of broke out of a motor going mcginnis yeah. be, honestly, well, i've always had a concept that if we did a, a world a world like those transatlantic things yeah if you got the likes of john and all those guys to track like carl army one, you'd get loads of crowd. If, obviously, now it's much easier to have a streaming service. And mm -hmm. if you had that sort of stock battle, you know what I mean, with the guys that are hitters from from all different echelons, and and if the money was right, it, it pays it pays everyone's wages, and it would be a massive spectacle, and it would be a leveler Trans as well. The Trans transatlantic free tech race. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get onto that later on. We'll get, get, onto get that's out. already <laughs> happened. That's already happened. But it, it happened in a low key, low key <laughs> scenario. No, um, the word, hold on, they were trying to do the World TT series. Yeah, oh, yeah, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were actually going to try what, and do like just touching on atmosphere. What you said about TV to reality. So I had all that perspective. Had all those conversations at racetracks. Two thousand seven, I think, it was the centenary year. Um, I don't know if it was Johnny. Johnny had gone over or whatever to to have a look. Anyway, I, I flew over. Someone go picked me up from the airport, drove me down to a house. I, I won't give away where it is quite yet. Anyway, walked to this house. You know, obviously, the Isle of Man houses are unique in their own way, if you know what I mean. So I walked through. Barbecue was going. Pristine hedge. All the rest of it. There's a few little holes in the hedge. I didn't quite understand at the time anyway. They said, oh, it's starting. It's starting. A couple of minutes. Literally standing in this garden with the you know water feature going and all the rest of it. And... Um, Everyone ran to the hedge, stuck their heads through the holes that they think they'd done, and um, I said, "Oh, come over, look, come over." I stuck my head through. I just heard this little howl in the in the distance, and I was looking, and there was a downhill coming towards me, then a little dip here, and then the road was here. And I was like, looking, looking left, looking right. Anyway, not very long, obviously. This motorbike goes through the bottom of Bray Hill, hits bottoms out, goes, and then all that noise, and the whole hedge like it, it like scratched the shit off my face because the, the hedge moved that much. I wasn't like prepared. I was like still too hard against the hedge and he flew past and I think it was John at the time and I, and that just I literally it happened so quickly that I stepped back the bike was already gone because I stepped back in fear you know from, from from seeing that it was like just blew my mind I was like we're standing here like in this hedge this hedge I'm telling you this hedge will never protect you <laughs> this is not going to help you at all <laughs> like this this hole in this hedge is not the future lads <laughs> when it was and then obviously the next the next blokes all just you know kept on coming and then eventually it became it became normal after a couple of beers in two days <laughs> that's it the shock that it shocked you so much absolutely coming from like a street racing background yeah. where you, you don't get any more raw than that but when you're doing it it's slightly different to 
but I, cause, him. Cause I'd watched it and you, and you don't, you know, you, you've, you've been buzzing around racetracks forever and at high speed and you think, oh, it's normal. And then that happened. Also, it was unexpected. No one prepped me. And, it didn't say, listen, we're at a barbecue where in about two minutes time, a motorbike's going to come past at 170 miles an hour. So, but it was, it was such a real experience. You was know? it an instant thing of like, when you seen it, were you like, I've got to do this at some point? Well, it was, it, it, in the initial um, respect for it was, was just it was mind blowing. It, it literally was uncomprehendable. The whole th- that I mean, I'd literally seen nothing of the island at that stage. So, and then the rest of the I think it was there for like a week. The rest of the week, you saw the you know the the, the vibe, the, the the everything else that goes on, other than the racing, which is which is part of the the appeal. If you from the live aspect, that's why I think what you said about the TV and the live, like. We I see a lot of sufferings when I was doing it, a lot of sufferings were traveling over as a and they were saying it was a once in a lifetime. I know a, a few couples, at least four families that have gone every year that that obviously other than COVID, that has been there since they went the first year, because they won't go on any other holidays anywhere else. They'll just go to the TT. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. So um yeah, the whole that whole experience of those days being there. And then I was down at uh, Peel when they had the, the the Mad Sunday down there and all that sort of stuff. That just yeah, completely sucked me in. And then it was it was on the cards to be done. Um, it was just when the timing and the bark and that was right. And what was the time gap between the hedge to actually going, I'm getting on the ferry with my bike, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a go? I think we did it. I, I think, I can't remember what happened. I was doing super sport at the time, so it didn't make sense. I was like, I need to get back into 2000s. And in 2010, um, we went back and did it. I did it in my own team. And uh, yeah, because I was riding, riding Superbike BSB at the t- in the Evo class at the time. So my only reservation was I wanted to be on a thousand to go and race a thousand there. Mm. That was hmm. my logic, but how much purpose that served, I don't know. But Did you go on the split that bike? No, initially. So in, initially, um, that year, 2010, I started with Malcolm Ashley racing at Kawasaki, which was a, was actually the probably the best bike, uh, strangely on the grid. And then he wasn't getting any support and, and the bike was eating gearboxes and it was just no money. And it, it sort of normal, sort of disjointed the team slightly. Mm-hmm. And then the Split Last Boys came along and won the rider. So I, I jumped ship to them. And obviously that was a, a lucrative scenario. So th- that was an easy transition, although the Prilia wasn't nearly as good as the Kawasaki. And everyone didn't really rate that Kawasaki. That Kawasaki is a Evo bike with the Motec on. was probably the, the best. It was better than the BM. It was better than everything else. It could do a better mm-hmm. lap time. And he went backwards on that. But... Uh, <laughs> I'd signed for the TT like the year before and I literally went and bought my TT bike off, off the reviews. Like I went back to old school and I went and bought a BMW because it was the fastest bike in 2010. I thought, well, if I'm going to that racetrack, I just need I the need, fastest I need power. bike. Yeah, I need power. Should have bought a Honda, you know, without being, because they're more for a new ride at the time. That was probably the most malleable bike. Yeah. Um, but obviously you didn't know the, 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 the BMW was by far the fastest but it was you know 20 horsepower more than everything else so but it was a bit of a handful around so there like, yeah <laughs> so <laughs> your, f- your first time on the tt was on yeah. a on my own bike so i took i took a kawasaki zx6r uh in super sport but it was semi-standard mm. and then i took a, a brand new i bought my own brand new bmw to go out and and always and always ask the same question first year at the tt what was your fastest lap Oh, I was one, I think it was 120 something. I was second fastest newcomer to David Johnson that year. So, and David was on a, on, on a the Honda. Southern Eversea rider yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I, bet, I bet that was great. <laughs> all over the, the whole career has been, oh, but the thing is, as soon as you, you mark them, then you find them everywhere, don't you? You know what I mean? They're all over the show. But DJ's a, a good lad. So, yeah. That's he, even worse, I bet. You know what I mean? I like bet me. you just wish he was an arsehole. You know I know. I, mean? I, I know. Mean, I wish he was an idiot. You know what I mean? He's been <laughs> such a nice guy. And uh, at this point, you, you'd already won the Superstock Championship. I mean, you would kind of glossed over that. Uh, no, so I, I knew what to <laughs> Yeah, so, massive highlight of his career. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just, just lost home. Yeah. I actually, I didn't get screwed over. We screwed ourselves over. One of the years in Superstock, I think it was the second year, I was winning the championship on, on the R1 raceways and everything was, because now we, we were set and going. And Rob Mack fired uh, James Hayden. So he rung Steve and said, listen, I want to uh, get Hudson on the park, blah, blah, blah. So obviously Steve sort of sold, not sold it to me, but told, told me what was happening. And at the time there was no resistance. But also, if you think back, like thinking about what was happening, if you had a manager, you wouldn't have made the step because mm-hmm. there was lots of stuff in the background that you could never know. You know, even Steve didn't know about that it was obviously going on. There was the tire war, the Pire- you know, on Pirelli's mm-hmm. because it was helping their budget. So lots of stuff that you said, well, let's go and test the bike or whatever. And then we turned up at um, at Alton. I rode the stock and the superbike, both both classes mm-hmm. the same day. And um, I think I qualified on a pole in the stock and then 12th or 15th, then top 15 on the, but between 12th or 15th on the super one. I was like Scott Smart and me were, were racing and um, Rob wasn't very happy. He said, oh, the, the stock bike's holding you back on the super bike. 
But this, this, the super bike that he had, or that they are, that R1 still ha- had electronics, but nothing worked. Mm. So it was like a nightmare to ride around it because it was mm. highly tuned and didn't work. And no wonder Tommy Hill was the, the other rider. Tommy was doing okay. Tommy was like top 10. He, every now and again, he got really well, but on average, he was like 8th to 12th, you know what I mean, as a, as a fair <laughs> assessment. But you had like Levia, Haslam on the Ducatis and some good bikes. So if you knew all that, you might have... But you just thought, oh, it's a, it's a factory ammo, you know, and I've, I've, this is my opportunity. It sort of r- ran at it. But um, So you pro- you would have won the Superstock Championship that year? We would have won it. Didn't. So, yeah, we, we, we and then after that race, we, we didn't win that Superstock race because it, it rained and they stopped the race. And then we went out on uh, wets or the wrong, whatever tires and thing, and it, it, the race didn't go to plan. But we still did okay. But, it, it, like, it was quickest the whole weekend on, mm-hmm. on that. You know, we're doing really well. And then, anyway, so Rob stopped me riding. So didn't ride Superstock for three rounds. And then... He sacked me at a Croft before I got to Croft. He just told Steve, but actually we probably would have made a, a step. We never would have got to where probably Rob wanted to be, but yeah. we were about to make a decent step with the was, bike. Was that tight. sacked on performance? Yeah, well, he, he just wanted instant results. So yeah. I think we had three rounds, and I think we went to Mondello, and I did I did really badly at Mondello. I, I underperformed at Mondello. It was shocking. Yeah. I think I crashed into Zanotti. It was Zanotti crashed into me, and there's a clip of me shouting at him. But it was more that the the. the the whole thing just wasn't working, but it was the that that bike basically going to bore you by tires. Now it was it was so front endy that you needed a, a really good front tire or a hard front tire, and the Pirelli was the opposite of that. So we tried it secretly at Dunlop, and you could you were never going to win, but you could go a lot faster. So Pirelli, I think, made a tire that was very similar to the Dunlop because they were they were it was beautiful because they would literally make you whatever you wanted. They just had no idea what to make. Yeah, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So yeah. that was the problem. So it was going to take more time than that. So it cost me that championship. So. I think I finished second to Glenn, but with three, three rounds yeah. missed. And then, uh, what what was the year that you did win the, the thirteen? Super- I went two thousand thirteen. Oh, so so after after yeah. the superbike yeah. thing, had yeah. you already won the Evo class? Yeah, uh, I came so I came second in stock that that year when I lost. Uh, we, we lost we lost those rounds. Yeah, I came second, and so the next year we then went to Super Sport, mm-hmm. and I finished second to Glenn in Super Sport on the Yamaha versus the Triumph battle. But again, it was quite went down to the last race, but there was. Like it was mathematically, uh, I think it was mathematically possible, but it was nearly a race. Mm -hmm. But we'd had an engine blow up in Donington. We were doing really well, which would have made the last race more of a a, a fight. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those things. But second was really good. And then um, I left raceways then, which was obviously in hindsight, definitely a mistake, if that makes sense, because I want, we needed to, well, I wanted to have direct results and and a lot of that stuff had happened. And also chasing a bit of money, a bit of, a bit of because there was still there was still money floating around the paddock at the time, so yeah. I was drawn away. And then we went and I rode um, seats and tuning had a really good bike with good sponsors. They were and Yamaha we, base as well. They were they? Yamaha, yeah, and I tested their bike. The only problem was in the year before I finished fourth at World Super Sports on the raceways bike at Donington, and um, we beat all the we beat Brock Parts and all those guys got and we, it was a dry race but wet qualifying and everything, mm. and the race was dry and it was like. Um, Johnny Ray, I think, won it. Uh, Pitt was second, the scores, and then me. It was fourth or fifth. Yeah, so it was a decent field. And the quick shifter stopped working on the second lap. So I had like such arm pump from because I haven't quick sh- I haven't changed gear like for five years, ten, <laughs> six years, and I was able to change gear one in the biggest more. race of of your life. So just one of those things. But um, still, you know, still in range of them. But it was it was a great race. But we were still riding a kitted Yamaha. That was my frustration with with raceways was that. We had everything in the parts catalog, but it was all the kit stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you looked at like Glenn's bike, you had all the Motec stuff. So mm-hmm. it might have been worse, but the point is that the lights looked more fancy. So you <laughs> you wanted that. You know what I mean? Just and again, you look back, you just think you should have just kept your mm-hmm. kept your cool. But mm-hmm. Yamaha then in the, the year I left, Yamaha then gave Steve full X. That they, basically he he went Can't over and he it. got a whole they got a Cal Crush low bike basically. Yeah. And uh, so you went to seat and tune on this Super Sport bike. On Super Sport, yeah. That wasn't that was a poor year. Jump from them to Kawasaki. I don't know if I won a race that year. I had a few podiums but not, nothing good. I had a few pole positions, but it wasn't it was a poor year. I uh, can't remember if I, I yeah, definitely a few crashes yeah. as well. And then um the year what was that? That was nine. So then ten was Evo. Mm-hmm. So that was a good year. So basically Stuart Higgs run um rang all, all the the sort of mediocre boys up or shall we say and say listen we're doing this Evo class probably when we come super bike spoke to some of the teams obviously like uh, Jenton um, MAR uh, Gary Johnson was on a Suzuki there was there was a few 
sort of teams that had been a super bike before, but they obviously weren't the top boys. And the prize money was 1,500 quid a, a race, two races a day. So three grand. I was back to the three grand scenario 10 days later. You're like, I'm back. Tom's like, we're having a bit of this, lads. <laughs> that's, it. that's it. I've got a mortgage to pay for. Let's crack on. Yeah, we're having it. And then I think me and, me and, uh, and again, back to Brogan, yeah, me yeah. and Brogan, like, won almost every one. Uh, there were a few South other South African and a Scouse yeah. lad racing for Chris, money. Chris yeah, Burns. there we are. Chris Burns was in it. Then, yeah, Chris was. So the, the brilliant team started with Chris uh, Joe. and Joe. Yeah, Chris and Joe. Yeah, Joe. Joe wrote a bike after Paddockillo. Yeah. I remember, yeah, yeah. Well, we turned up to our sold. I got out of, I got into rider management and then immediately out of it because we'd gone to the first round. And because we had, well, not me, but the team had the Arctic and everything, we bought two um, ZX6s to re- rent out to youngsters to ride. So that, that all happened anyway. One of them qualified, one didn't because they were back to those big qualifying grid scenarios. And the dads are all scrapping. I'm trying to get going. I didn't, t- I didn't ruin this Kawasaki until we got to to brands, to BSB, mm-hmm. no testing, no nothing. So I'm getting quicker and quicker. Then next thing I see Joe bouncing a bike down Paddockle, made me feel uh, sorry for him, but a bit better for myself. <laughs> At least I haven't done that though. Because I was, it was shocking at the time. I was still, everything just felt so alien. And um, I had the, the dads were scrapping up with the, the super stock kids. And I was just like, this isn't gonna happen. And luckily for me, what saved me is I had um, some friends who worked in security, really big, big burly South Africans that had come to watch me just as mates and I said could you just go and sort them out anyway they, they had to pay some money to the organisers and to Tybles they just literally picked them up and just carried them to wherever they needed to swap their cards paid and then just sent them on their way so that was that was done so we we, we got out of that are they, are they, do they live locally I'm just wanting to watch me back here you know, do they still live yeah, you know. they, were, they, were, they were okay the problem is it's just you, if your expectations that you're going to go and win super stock 600s it's not possible and the, and the bikes were you know they were stock bikes so they were they were decent and we were living a dream because we are all in the pit lane and I was still thinking back to my first year when my little red tent down the middle I'm like lads you don't know how lucky you are and mm-hmm. so my fuse was about that short for them I had like no interest yeah. and, and I was struggling and so. from the 2000 so the Evo class for yep. people that don't, aren't aware it was um so before bsb got rid of open electronics and went to the standard like so everyone runs the same motec system they kind of trialed it with an evo class mm-hmm. so it was a class within a class which yourself and like the the people you've just mentioned and then th- those rules were then expanded to the whole championship which is what we've got now yeah uh, did you do a few few years in evo class we, just... we only did we did that year and basically um the next year the aprilia team changed the super bike but arrived with a with a standard bike if that makes sense so we tried to run an aprilia the next year but, and never if we went we moved to Superbike, but yeah. it never Split that. the Superbike never happened. But Derek Redmond was very involved with that. Type, wasn't yeah, it? yeah, Derek Redmond was involved. Um, yeah, there was there was lots of you know, high profile people around that team. Yeah, so it was good. I was. Um... I was, it's what, like a weird sort of link, you know, when you sort of private life and your sort of job and stuff all mm. in a link. So like say Derek Redmond would always be at BSB and, yeah. you know, like I, uh, through Zoe Burn, I got to like sort of meet him and sort yeah, of be yeah. friends and he like followed us on Twitter and stuff. And I was, at the time I was only about like probably about 14 or whatever. Yeah. And then I was at school and uh, there were, Derek Redmond always gets used in assemblies, you know, for like against uh, adversity, like keep yeah. going and all of that yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. determination what he, he, always, what he did in the Olympics and yeah, yeah, yeah he always yeah. comes up in like loads and loads of assemblies and uh, I remember like watching an assembly on Derek Redmond being like oh yeah I'm like sort of friends with him like he follows us on Twitter and people are like yeah of course he does and you're like no no he doesn't like, <laughs> I was speaking to him at the weekend like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not one of my mates but like no, you know sure. you sort yeah. of know and he's a sound like, he's, you know, like you wouldn't oh he's brilliant he's, he's pretty I bet, guy, yeah. he's, I bet he goes oh there's a stalker Chrissy Rouse again <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean I keep on following him such a picture head didn't he those days you was racing in uh, the hot tracks endurance as well so we used to do some races with them i think he had his own team yeah from what i remember but um we used to go and do races and yeah got on i mean i know you did the pit boarding for me at like alton one of the times and mm. yeah when we were it's funny that well. do you know that uh that olympics was like the best thing that's ever happened to him yeah yeah that like injury a, yeah even if you won it wouldn't be that good. injury because yeah. even to this day you know like He's like a f- so famous, and off the back of that, being able to do so many, he's be- being able to use that that um, you know uh, that show, platform, show yeah. of determination, yeah, yeah, yeah. public determination, yeah, yeah. like that's it's. I mean, it's a great story. Everyone can kind of relate to it, yeah. and then you can expand that out into like business and life in general, Absolutely. and then sort of, and it's um, yeah, it's been an uh, amazing thing. But uh, from yeah. from knowing him, he definitely you know what happened on that day in the bits I've seen in. When he's had lesser adversity in in the motorsport world, it has come to the forefront. So it's quite nice to have seen it again, if you know what I mean, firsthand. Mm -hmm. And obviously knowing that that legendary clip and and what happened then and 
you know, all that. And, and obviously, what, yeah, seen after it was, it was me. And also to be able to just, like you say, just be able to interact with a legend, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really cool. So, um, I'm just kind of yeah. going through your timeline. No, so you sure. went to the Evo thing and yeah. then straight back to Superstock after that. No, Superbike. So, we, so Splitleth into Superbike in 2011. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, that didn't, basically they were promised a Max Biaggi one-year-old bike that we got to the first round and the bike still had headlights on us. So I knew it was game over. So yeah, just one of those under-delivering. They, they, they got let down essentially, but I'm sure in the background there was money that should have changed hands and then didn't. Right. Um, but yeah, they, they were definitely... You know, it, it, from the talk is that they are pretty uh, are quite good at you know supporting racing. That's obviously you can see that now. MotoGP they they were supporting the superbikes a lot then, so they had a lot of kits. But it was just I'm sure the kit to the cost to run them was you know what we knew was was massive. And the way those bikes were because they were the V that the the proper superbikes the had like a gear driven cam. So you had to have a major conversion. You couldn't just borrow some cams or something mm -hmm. at the back door. You needed a full engine. So it actually was even more difficult than going like trying to build a hybrid or something like that. It yeah. wasn't possible. So yeah, that was that was that year. And then um we finished that year up. And then in 2012, I was back to saying, you know, the, the Evo thing. Well, Evo was still I think Evo still went in twelve, but we went in that and um obviously by thirteen and then went to super superbike yeah. as it is now. Uh, sorry, 12, I went to Super, super like 12 or 13 went to Super now. But in 12, I went and I thought, well, the only way I'm going to make money the, the way or enjoy racing, afford to race, and hopefully make some money out of it by winning. Because, you know, I've either been second or I'd won lots of races, but finished second lots of championships for various reasons, um, was to run our own team. So I got a hold of a friend of mine who had done quite well for himself up in Scotland. Uh, I own Nick Balance, and I said to him, this is my my plan, but and this is how it'll work, and but we need some budget to to make it happen. And um, yeah, he, he was in a position to be able to do that. He wanted to do that to push his brand. So that came quite easily. We had some old sponsors that came on board and we had our own team and it was okay. It was probably, I probably underestimated because I thought I'd been here, done it before. I'll do it again and, and had a bit of an awakening. Um, and then I crashed at uh, Thruxton in turn two and broke my back. So I was lying. So I broke my back. But then by this stage, I had, now I had a day job working at uh, in finance because I'd studied finance in, in school. So I changed over. So when I <laughs> when I eventually got a chance to get a real job, I'd moved into finance. I was working for Lloyds Bank. And I remember going into... That is such a grown-up thing for a motorcycle racer. I know. It changed completely. But it was just a... You could have had me at gunpoint. I would never, yeah, ever have guessed that. Yeah. I'm impressed. Carry on. So, Sorry that. So <laughs> I, would, I broke my back then, but wasn't disabled, luckily. But... Um, they didn't scan me because those they didn't have that scanner at BSB then, and I was trying to p pretend I was brave and uh, <laughs> remember couldn't really drive home because of what was going on. Got to the office um, on Monday, tried to go in, and sat in, in the office and and I couldn't couldn't stand up. Like you could, it was, my legs were particularly weak, and then realized obviously then went for some X rays and realized there was a bit of swelling going on that wasn't wasn't great, but it was stable. So that wrecked my year. And then basically what happened was that same sponsor said, "Listen, you." Your knack, it's when I sort of, you think you recovered. I went and rode for Brent on his Aprilia in Superstock, the WD40 team. And that was a good place to be. It was quite cool, but we just lacked pace for, for lots of reasons. Obviously, I wasn't in a great shape. And then we rolled the Kawasaki out at the last round, the same one that from the beginning at the last round of uh, BSB. And I finished fourth at the, I think it was the Brands Long on our own little team with Tony Homer had a, had, had a rig in that. And, and we just said, listen, can we piece something together? You know, because we want to, I've been riding and, and it was quite funny. I'd be at BSB, you've been told by a team that you're, you know, you shit and you, you don't know what you're doing. But I'd, I'd been there like a week before and been not lap record pace, but been really quick on my Kawasaki and been like, yeah, but I know. Like, I'm not shit because two, yeah. two days ago I was on that bike doing this laptop, you know. But you didn't, it wasn't, but that never came in conversation. But you, so you, you luckily that. I knew. Yeah. And we, so we, anyway, we went through and um, the next year we said, well, 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 we'll try and do it a bit better than 12 and don't, don't crash. And uh, yeah, and 13 went sort of to plan. But we were on such a, because obviously everything had degraded really from a, all those sponsors were now in year two. And the whole world had changed. You know, we had the recession, all that mm. stuff. So all those, Glory days I spoke about before; those were definitely gone. gone, yeah, completely back to not how we are now, but I think worse than than yeah. it is now. And um, it, it, this is God's honest truth: the whole year we raced, we never had a spare front wheel. Never had a spare front wheel. We had two spare rear wheels. We had, a, we had a spare one spare rear wheel and one front wheel on the bike. That was it. We won the championship with no spare front wheel, 
So that's and two tire leaves that you we, nicked. Yeah, well, I think tire leavers from Dunlop. <laughs> 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 was this the Don't tri- worry, trick motor? Yeah, BMW. Trick motor. So we had we had budget to run, and, but it was like if you crashed and wrote the bike off, then you would have potentially an issue. Um, you know, I think I crashed at um, Silverstone and the Silverstone 200. We did that like MotoGP warm up. Yeah, but luckily it was at it was at cops at the end of the straight, but the bike didn't bounce. But I remember borrowing some fairings from a, uh, one of the teams. And they were green, and we, we we didn't want to paint them, so we wrapped them. And they just I said this, and they were really heavy, so I, I ordered some, but they weren't ready in time. And mm-hmm. we dragged our heels ordering them. Anyway, we got to the next race, which was at Silverstone, BSB round, and we just wrapped them. Well, I said, to them, "Listen, if we damage them, we'll give you the new ones that are on order." And the guys d- didn't really like it; had some sort of attitude issue. I think we we're trying to take it off the bike, and that was that yeah. was the problem we had. I said, "Listen, we don't. It's like an hour to the race. If we damage them, you don't need them. You know, they didn't need them. It was just being a bit funny." Could understand it because they they sort of helped I think we helped Tony out but anyway I intervened they were having an argument I intervened and we all got into a bit of a scrap at Silverstone so it was a, that was about ten minutes before qualifying we were like thumping each other put our helmets on then went and qualified I think it was on pole at Silverstone with, with their fairings on and I said if you want the fairings you have to kill me so that's that's what's going to happen <laughs> that's, that's that simple and I said it hasn't worked out so well so yeah we were bloody noses with a proper scrap all their mechanics ours. I think my dad was involved. I was involved. It was literally, it was, I can't, I it can't. was brilliant. We, we, Gareth come down. He said, oh, does it mean something? No, I said, no, because you get thrown off when you get thrown yeah, out yeah. the track. So, yeah. but we had, we didn't actually go to scrap. It all happened in the garages. So mm. yeah, it was really tight on budget. So the next fairings arrived. We painted them, did give them their fairings back. Didn't nick them if anyone, you know. Want, <laughs> just to want, clarify. It, yeah. I didn't, we could have had them back in 10 minutes. I just couldn't have them back that minute. That yeah. was the only problem. It was the timing. I'll tell you what though, I can't wait for this podcast to go out with the amount of people braining each other in the garage to get hyped <laughs> Up for pole position and qualify. Honestly, I was, I was, right. my, but my parents read well, my dad had realized that, uh, they said that when you when you get a, if you get something that irritates you before a race you definitely go to a new level so I don't know if they used to try and get that to happen but that <laughs> Hudson, was, Hudson uh, Kennedy's uh, psychological <laughs> performance coaching here that's it getting told. So get yeah, revved that, that year was uh, was it Adam Jenkins in your main yeah Jenko was Jenko was up there Buck, um, was Buchan in it that year no Buchan was the next year he came in but uh, we had I think we had uh, Halloran might have been there this, that year yeah the Hondas were there the Another factory, southern hemisphere. I'm the, just yeah, like at the, the factory hundreds. <laughs> well, the other thing that happened was um, so that that was one scrap. We didn't have any other scraps, and then I, we found some money halfway through the year before Alton to have the park rebuilt. Some, you know, because it was two years old now. So we had all this done, and Ray Stringer did it. He got it back, got to Alton, put the engine in before, uh, didn't die or anything. Just went straight to the track. You know, got it. Did four laps. It was like flying. Like you know, Ray's a really, really, really good bike builder, and the thing was like. I was just like, this is going to be so much better than it was before. And we were, we were still at one races. Anyway, in the fifth lap, it blew up. So um, we didn't know why at the time, but basically what happened is a little nut on the oil pump had been left not tight enough and the oil pump fell off, so it destroyed the engine. So obviously it was just filings everywhere. So we seen there was a, when you weren't allowed to spare, we didn't have a spare bike, we didn't have a spare front wheel, but the point was we, you weren't allowed a spare bike. So Johnny Towers had a track day ZX-10 uh, in his uh, in his garage, just like just fiber lost up. But the problem was you couldn't just go and borrow a bike because you weren't allowed. You had to swap an engine. Mm-hmm. So then we left Alton. Well, my dad left Alton. He got about ten miles down the road, had a blowout on the front left, changed the tire, then had a blowout on the front right because the van's tires were like ten years old. It was like a racing van. It didn't didn't do any mileage. So the tires had got to an age. So now we got a blown engine and a van stuck on the side of the road with a blown tire. So eventually he gets the tire changed. We get tire guy out, gets to Johnny's, picks it up, brings it back. We had to take the engine out of his bike, put it into our bike, take the swap the engines from the two motorbikes across. Right. Is this is ZX10 to a BMW. No, no, two ZX10s. Oh, I right. was on a ZX10 right. that year, so Johnny had a ZX10. So we had took his engine out, put it in my bike. My engine was toast. Swapped him over because you couldn't change the whole bike. You had to because the frame wasn't smashed, so you couldn't change mm-hmm. the frame. And if the frame was smashed, you could you had to keep the engine. You had to do a frame swap. Yep. You know, which makes sense if you crash, but it doesn't make sense in this example. But anyway, point wise, we did all that. And his thing was like terrible. It was like worse than my, my, my one before. Just subtle differences. You know, when you're like you're talking a swing of six or seven horsepower, Victor Cox was racing then as well. He was he was quite a good guy on the on the covers. Anyway, the race started and we I think we finished fourth. I finished fourth in the race. And uh, they came down and they got a little piece of paper in part firma and said, um, you know, we're gonna strip your bike. But they knew, the scrutineers knew that we changed the engine. Yeah. They know it's not my engine that we started with. So I said, it's not my engine, guys. I borrowed this engine. He's got a tractor on Wednesday. No, we're stripping. So when I saw Stuart, had a conversation with them. 
Anyway, they were at a bit of an altercation later, which they can tell you their story in their own time. But it cost who, them. Who's that? The, the rest, the, Johnny and Stuart and all of them had their own chat. But I went and warned them one. I said, listen, guys, it's not my engine. I've literally borrowed this engine from someone else. It just happens to be this chap who we all know. And it's legit. So you, you strip, strip me next weekend. You know I mean, or next race when it's my engine. But I don't really want to give his engine back in a box, if you see what I mean, or try and get it yeah, rebuilt. Yeah. So anyway. They stripped us, they stripped the Honda, whatever. So we pulled it all apart, the crankcase, cranks, everything, visual delight. So pulled apart, the engine was like, it was destroyed, it was worn out. It was like the valves were hanging off it, everything. So in the end, I tried to sell it to him, like I did him a favor. He still wasn't happy with me. He's pissed off because he like missed his track day. He didn't want his bike stripped. Gave him, literally, can you imagine going back to his house? There's your frame. There's your engine, mate. You're welcome. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, he has a case of beer. Cheers for that. So um, you weren't very happy. So, um, <laughs> Although I tried to send the dream that actually saved them a bit of time. So then while we were there, I tried to buy the, the factory Hondas. I said, lads, you stripped your Honda. They're only 15 grand in the thing. I'll write you a check. And buy that Honda off you now. I didn't want to sell the Hondas. Don't know why. I just didn't want to sell this. They're standard Hondas. They wouldn't sell them to us. It was just because they were like quite fast at the time, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's a bit of banter going on. And then Jenko's mechanic. Were you, were you saying that in uh, like tongue in cheek? No, no. I'm serious. Uh, were, no, no. I my, I've got them. my checkbook. I said, there you go. I said, you can cash it. I said, I'll do a transfer now. I'll buy the bike of you. They're about 15 back in back in those days. Not like now. Yeah. They're 35. <laughs> cheap then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, don't get a racing discount as well because you guys did. Anyway, they wouldn't do it. But while we're having that, Jenko's mechanic, Alex is the name. I wasn't there. I'd, I'd like left the situation now. He started getting on a Tony Homer. Because he didn't, he said, oh, I don't like your attitude because uh, we'd been on at the Honda lads, but not aggressively, you know, in a, in a not generally trying to buy the bike, you know, just saying, yeah, yeah. they were abnormally fast. They're just thinking you're all being sarky in that. Yeah, so you didn't, well, Jenko and us were, we were probably more in the hunt. So he was, he probably had to go. Anyway, they nearly had a scrap when they were, they were then, right? I wasn't involved in, in that. And then, um, but me and Adam, we're like, we, we, not mates, but we racing mates, if you know what I mean. Well, yeah. Never had a drop. Matt Adam's a sound lad and we never had a thing, but it was funny how the team, Mackies were like arm wrestling each other in the in the in the, in the bay, <laughs> having a puff with each other. And but did, that was good. Did that championship go down to the wire? And... Yeah, the last round, I think I had to finish top ten, and he could win it, and I would win the championship. So it was the first time all my other ones I'd got to, and I was always on the back foot for one reason or another. Yeah, but that was the one I got to, and I could manage it. So it rained at Brands, bit of an iffy race. I think I finished fifth or sixth, and then we won the race. But then. Again, a bit of a sour. They have to strip the box when you win. I don't know if they, they probably yeah. stripped yours. Yeah. And then they said uh, they want to sh- strip the box. I said, yeah, that's fine. I said, but is there any like compensation? They said, no, there's nothing. I said, but that's like 450 quid for me to put it back together. So anyway, I booked a, a restaurant uh, here for friends and family. Uh, obviously, we had brands. So I stripped the box. Obviously, it was legal. Um, and then we had a bit of a thing at the track, quickly packed it and left. I think my dad and Tony stayed there to carry on. And then we all headed up here with the missus and all, all loads of friends. And we came up here. So I got a phone call saying, oh, we're doing the uh, start line photographs. I said, yeah, you see the bike that's in the last garage that you got in the box? Put that on the grid and take a picture of that because it just cost me 450 quid. <laughs> so the next year, the roads and the rules, if you win, you have, have to be to. do it. Because I said, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm 10 beers in and two steaks in front of me. I'm, I'm done. I don't care. But in hindsight, you know, you wish you maybe took the picture because you, you, there's an element of that. But it was all, I don't know, they have to strip the bike. But the point is that you want a championship and then go down, you know, best part of, five, at best, 500 quid. You know what I mean? And your bike's literally in a box. There was no prize money for winning the championship. That was that was the, basically the bugbear of the of this year. And then you're stripping the bike. I know I, if it was someone who beat me, I'd want you know I'd want the bike stripped to get checked. So I, that's not my issue. Yeah, my issue is that it's just like it's like a negative. You know, yeah. you win and then they, and you then pay a five hundred quid bill. Mm-hmm. You know, the bill at the restaurant is only two hundred quid. <laughs> <laughs> You're working. You can tell you're in finance. I've got 700 quid down in, in the space of four hours winning a championship. There's no ways that's a that's a winning combination. And then <laughs> after, I mean, after people take a note of this, what are they about? Yeah, after winning yeah. that championship, what was, well, did you then stay in Superstock again yeah. for a few years, or what was? Yeah, it? basically all I did then is again. I, I was lucky that that year because we had had such a lean year with the the way we ran it. That yeah. there was a bit of prize money. There is in in the normal races. There was a bit of payback on tires. So. We were we weren't making a fortune, but I had my day job and I wasn't I wasn't costing me to race and I was winning lots of you know and podium lots of races. So you were still getting the twelve hundred quids, fifteen hundred quids. So it was decent. It was a de- financially decent year. And it's not all about the money. You race because like we said before, you enjoy it and you get the kick. But I always said to anyone I was in a contract negotiation, which is why some of the teams didn't like 
the way it went. I said, you can't win the race on Sunday and have your house repossessed on Monday. That's That just can't be the way it is. So I, I said, if you know, if, if you want me to pay 60 grand for a ride, that's fine. But if I win the championship, I want 120 grand because that's that's my ratio. Mm-hmm. If I don't win or, or if we don't hit these targets, because you're telling me I need to pay X amount of money or someone needs to, or we need loads of new tires because we need this performance element. But obviously, that's if you think about it, that's why I never ended up riding for those teams that were sort of middle rung that needed budget because I, we could provide budget. There was people, you know, even even myself, we could put something in. But my expectation was that if you look back at my career, I probably had one one and a half years where I didn't deliver. The rest of the time, I you was always know. there or thereabouts. So even after the 2013, so the point was that like there's no payback here you yeah. know, from you guys. So that was my issue, and that's why sometimes the bad rep. Obviously, there's been a few. Uh, altercations with the ones I've mentioned now, but the point is that's why they didn't like that, you know. And then equally, as time went on, I got myself in a in a better place, you know. As a team, we so fourteen we rode for BMW. Mm-hmm. We got full support from them. We got bikes. We got loads of stuff. And Kawasaki, when in negotiation with them, it was quite interesting. That I said to them, well, "We've won the championship. What do we get for next year?" Well, we might give you a discount. Might do this. Might do that. BMW offering motorbikes, spares, package, everything. Have them, yeah. yeah, and they said, "Well." Everyone's on a Kawasaki because in thir- by the end of thirteen, like mm. not, other than the two hundreds which they wouldn't sell, were on Kawasaki's. Mm. So they um, the they said well, everyone's on Kawasaki's. I said, "Well, I'll go into BMW." And it, it was tougher, you know. There was challenges with that because of the the infrastructure, but it was still a good bike. You know, yeah. if I'd been a bit better, then that bike could have won. You know, or won more. You know, it, it did alright. But yeah, and then Danny came through, and then the the younger guys are sort of putting you under pressure, and you know. There's lots of good riders. You know, we have to believe you're the best when you go into a race, otherwise you beat. Yeah. But you also have to think, how do you deliv- deliver that? Yeah. And then the other man, TT, I think it was um, 15, I crashed there and I broke my back again at Braddon Bridge. And that... that oh, yeah. Yeah, that was... that's a, It's a quite interesting story because I basically I was on the twin uh, sponsored by Sherlock's Kawasaki. Mm-hmm. And they were really good bike. And I think I saw P11 on the board onto that last lap. And I had the bike in the garage the whole year and sort of gone through it, rode it a few times. But the mind, you know, those twins, they sort of drop off and it was dropping off. You could feel the engine was getting a bit softer. So I thought, I want to be top 10, or maybe more, but I can only make it up on the brakes and corners and so forth. So anyway, by the time I got to Braddon, I went in there and I, I braked super late, but I think I had a manhole cover, tucked the front in a straight line. So like literally didn't slow down and then slid into the bridge. So, and then it was like ticketed. But... Um, tick, 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 yeah, that is the most polite way yeah, of I was in a bad way. Go, and then I sort of remember bits of it, but the, the interesting, the, the, the moral bit of the story is that I was lying in um, hospital at Isle of Man on the same day. And, and I think worse stuff, yeah, stuff happened in the senior that was probably worse, but they would, they'd scan me and done all that stuff. And I said, it's stable, but I'd had all this story before when in 12. And I said, okay, cool. And I said, well, when you can walk, you can, um, you can crack on. You can you, you can get go out. So anyway, my mom, my mom uh, started. She she had early Alzheimer's then, but she was oh, still functional. But the point is, she had gone across to the police station and said, "Oh, my son's crashed in the race." So the police drove her to the hospital. So she's the only one that's turned up at the hospital because the rest all panicking, running around like headless chickens. The rider crashes at the CT. She was like logical. Left them, went there. So she was still functional at the time, and she turned up, and I was lying there. And all these other guys that had hurt their ankles and all the rest were lying like you in the blue sheets. With, with, with moaning and I was like I'm in pain but I'm you know loads of drugs uh, up and could feel my toes and all that so she came there we were there for a few hours and I said just help me up so she got me up anyway called the doctor I said, I said can I go they said no you can't go you can't walk I said well if I can walk so if you can walk to the end of that hallway and phone a taxi you can leave and he thought you're never gonna he's never gonna do that never test a bike no. so exactly <laughs> so I got her to help me I've got my legs done and I said you can't help me like at all so she's I said mom can't help me don't don't help me in front of this doctor so anyway he came back got up and I like shuffled down to the thing, picked up the phone, rung, rung the taxi. And the doctor said, listen, I'm not taking any responsibility for this. Anyway, taxi had to wait like half an hour. I did the paperwork, gave me a few um, disparate or whatever it was. And um, the guy I turned up in the taxi was a guy that's called Ago. He's well known on the Isle of Man. He's a taxi driver. He rides in the classic. Anyway, he took me back. All he was on about was the, the race. And I'm sitting there in like agony, like not wanting to talk about it. So we got back and I remember nothing from then on till I got back to to home here. I was staying here, and uh, yeah, that, I don't remember any of the trip back, the ferry, nothing, because I remember just people were giving me more and more tablets to to take away the pain. But the next weekend, I had a BSB race at Snetterton, so I basically lay in bed until Tuesday. I didn't know what I was doing until Tuesday, and then I tried to fight with neighbours three doors down because they had a band on or something, which I normally used to go and you know, listen to their band. So I was 
quite far gone. But I couldn't get there, so it was I couldn't walk down the stairs at the time. Anyway, I went into work at that stage. I was working for Santander Bank, so I went into work in Ashby. <laughs> I keep forgetting your I'm, I'm bank. So I, had to go, I thought I can't go racing. I'll get sacked. Go go racing without going into work for a week because they said I've crashed the bike and then go and race again. They never get to understand that. Oh, I took a few tablets, man. I, I was all right. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I need to go down, but everyone said you're never, you're not going to race, you know, because it's stay and also you won't pass the medical. So I went into the thing on Thursday and I had like four or five clients had to see, but in between each client, I just lie on the floor and I'd take more. I was gray, like taking tablets, sweating. Anyway, I got to Snedderton, did the um, the medical and made me do all stuff. I was on tramadol and all sorts, had to balance on one leg, got through, and I was in the hyperbaric chamber every every night. If you look at the results, it was like stone last, mid group, or mid pack, whatever it was, and I ended up qualifying like 12th or 8th, something like that. But anyway, in the race, I ended up finishing third. Shut up, man. I swear to God. Couldn't believe it. I don't know how. I don't know. It must have been really, really good happy because I struggled the rest of the year, you know what I mean, with with that injury. But somehow, it's, I think instead it's quite flat. So mm-hmm. it, it meant, and if you watch what I was riding, I was like old Rigid. 1960s. That's how I was. You know what I mean? One of those. So yeah, I was just crazy. And then because I was trying to, if you missed a round, the championship was gone. So so the little things like that. So that was like the the, the, the part of the uh, the equation of you know, sort of come, not coming to an end, but you start realizing, you know, after that, the t- uh, it wasn't, it was completely my my fault. You know, the TT crash was just mentality changed and then the error occurred. So Was that last, was that last crash at the TT the last time you rolled there at the island? Uh, I think, it, yeah, I think it was the last did time. That, I don't, did, I can't that, remember now. Was that the deciding factor to stop you going back? Or no, did, no, 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 it wasn't. I might have gone back one more. I think, no, I think, no, I'd, I think, I can't remember if I went back one more year after that. I can't remember now. And is that, it was the last year. Is that a chapter kind of closed in your life or are you open to the... Well, I met Donna. We, you went to Northwest 200. I nearly did that that God. year because I, I was going to do. Yeah, you didn't actually do it. No, because I signed with Ryan Farquhar to do. I thought I'd upset you. <laughs> no. <laughs> I signed with Ryan to do it all because I exactly that thinking, well, I just want to keep going. I enjoy, I still enjoyed the roads. I was going to do the TT uh, and the Northwest, but basically realized. Went and raced the bikes at uh, and did well at Bishop's Court. Did I think one on the thousand and for the second or third on the twin, and some tough tough competitors. But the point was that I realised without a BSB program or that many laps, I was going to be so rusty when I got there that I wasn't going to be up to speed. Mm. So I needed a program that I didn't have, and the team I was riding for was over there. So it meant reinvesting, you know. And also, the day I, I stopped at BSB when I when we left um, Knock Hill. We left before the race because they were like, they were trying to basically move me to the back of the grid and all the rest of it. So I just said, listen, I'm done. Came back, reflected for a week. So was, that was the first race I never missed. Like, a, I'd never been injured like a for BSB a race. race yeah. Never missed a beat. So I literally missed that race <laughs> from the first time all my, my whole career. I never ever missed a, a round from injury or, or anything. I, I do wow. kind of remember. I think I was wow. in the paddock then. I mm. remember there was like, obviously, you just chatter. hear like loads of like, chatter, gossip, yeah, yeah, chat about what happened. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was a, it, everyone says you're banned in the center. Basically, all that happened. We've hired um, Knock Hill since then. So the Knock Hill officials, we, we finished the TT. Oh, I did do the TT one more time because we'd done the TT again. That was it. Yeah. That year. The next year. So I went back. Yeah, that was it. And that was the catalyst. We did it. And I bought a brand new bike to finish the BSB season on. Mm-hmm. And because all the rigorous checks, it takes a long time to get all the ECU sealed and all the, all the stuff checked, which is fine. So we I did mark, uh, we borrowed, hired a rig to go there and be set up before because it's not cool, miles away. And we drove up through the night, got to the main gate, had the new bike in the back of my little v- VW van. almost. And what dawned on me, this is the same conversation I had with him in 2006. Do you know what I mean? When I had to wait four hours at the gate and didn't know anything and thought it was normal. You know, now I'm like 10 years on and I'm having the same conversation with the same people. And and it was like, it was quite fresh. So I was explaining, listen, all we want to do is get in and leave this bike of scrutineering. You can't drive in. Okay, well, I'll push the bike in. No, you can't push the bike in. I said, what am I meant to do? You need to move. And so it was, it was this like weird negative conversation, which makes sense when you're looking at the thousands of people that need to be there. But individually, it made no sense to me. Like I'm paying 400 quid entry to be here. And I, I should just be like, you should help me push my bike there. If you see yeah. what I'm trying to say, that's the way it should be, not a load of attitude, if you see what I mean. And, and I, they always said, everyone said, well, I'd shout and scream. I actually, I, I don't shout and scream. I never even swear when I'm when I'm dealing with uh, people on the, because of that professional outlook. Mm-hmm. And it was just logic. It was like no sense. So one of the things I did, I said, I'll just leave the van here until you decide what you want to do. So if you touch the van, I will, you'll get arrested for theft. I said, so. That's we can play top trumps all day long. <laughs> top 
I said, but wh- whatever you want to do, guys. So eventually they let us in. Eventually they caved and just said, yeah, just take your, your motorbike to Scrutineering. Thank you very much. Because we've been driving six hours to come to the side of a hill in Scotland and ride motorbikes and paying you 450 quid for the privilege. Yeah. You know, so it's like, let's, you know, if I'm at a rock concert, I'm getting a little bit emotional if there's a queue. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was my, and, and, then, and obviously that wasn't the first time. At every racetrack you got to, when you own your own team, as and I think you rode your, your own team last was the year before. I've done in the past. After yeah, the past, yeah, yeah not last year. And the point is that when you start doing that and start to see all the other stuff that hinders those, because they ring you, they're not ringing a team manager. And so when you get called in, because someone's maybe misbehaved, one of your team guys has, you know, had too many beers and had an arm wrestle he shouldn't have had or whatever, you're getting called up. So now you're the rider and the team owner. So you're seeing it from a different perspective. And that was my, and so that was, that was wrong. Then they tried to find me and then they said, well, you're stuff in the back of the grid or you can't, you, you might not ride this race or whatever. Else. I said, you know what, I'm not even interested. I'll pack myself and go. And then I left and reflected. And literally within a week, I could sell the bikes. I think those bikes were worth like 20 grand each. And all yeah. of a sudden, I thought I owned everything. And I sat back and I thought, I've got like, you know, a significant amount of kit here. I sold it one. I've never been richer in my whole life. All those financial stories that that big payday you spoke to every factory team about, I just gave myself one by not going to the next race. Yeah. And and I was like, why am I doing this? But I still wanted to ride. So hence why I wanted to do the roads. But the other problem that happened is the, the, the reason I cracked on that day was because I'd been at the TT where when you drive into the paddock, everyone half fives you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're half fiving you. The security guards are half fiving you talking about your practice the day before you're having all the good crack with everyone. There's literally even the, even the top, top, top bananas, top of the ACU, top of everyone. They're all treating you like a civilized human being. And I got to the next place and there was individuals that run that paddock that were just treating you like you're something on the bottom of someone's shoe. And you're like, never, ever is this right. Yeah. And that was, and I called them on it, you know, in a very professional way. And that's what they don't, especially don't like, you know? Mm. So that was, uh, they want you to rent and rave, but, and that's probably the whispers that they try to say. But if I'd rented a rave, they would have had a black car. So it wouldn't have been. It, there was no there was no rent. And I, well, I would have had a black car. You know what I mean? But it, yeah, it yeah. never got to that stage. Is, is and then pole position. Here's a good question for you then. <laughs> Obviously, you've seen it from like the riders and the team manager perspective. Mm. And now that you've run your own series. Again. Yeah. Do you, have you sort of seen a flip side that you've. Yeah, there's a sort of a. Have you seen it in a different light? Hundred percent, and that's why I said it makes logical sense. I completely agree. When you see it from from those guys' side, you look at the the paddock. You just have to stand, and, and then you know the dynamic of that many people. Everyone's different. You know what I mean. So you don't want an individual who's, you know, their specific problem that I've driven through the night and arrived there with a new bike isn't their problem. You know, and if they say, "Well, there's 240 competitors here that are all telling me the same story," it wouldn't work. But mm. there has to be a middle ground. So yes, a hundred percent, we see it. You know, we're well, boring around noise complaints. We're trying to be the quietest series that we can be because we run a twenty-four hour event. Yes. So and also the way forward is quieter box, and we have a series that can be the quietest and doesn't affect our performance. It definitely affects a thousand cc or six fifty twin because those are high performance vehicles. These these bikes aren't if you know what i mean and they they can live under these restraints and make a, knee, a noise limit of roughly 90 db which is like an average road bike but that still sounds okay with the with the, with the british made system that we sort of recommend they go and buy but the point is that so you see people and then someone comes up to you and says but my my mechanic said this will work and it's 106 db so you, you see the opposite side where you're thinking you don't realize you're putting everything at risk because yes. of 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 a story so i 100 percent agree that i think from difficult. from like the um, obviously I've worked as a teacher for yeah. a good good number of years and it's it's a little bit like that when you're a student and you think like your teacher's being like a dick for something and yeah. you're like thinking like and very much like um, there might be like saying something like for example the school I went to had like uh, very very strict rules on like that you weren't allowed hair touching your collar and all the time I was at school I was thinking like what a ridiculous rule is like that actually affecting my education exactly you know and, I mean? and you have you have that type of conversation yeah, yeah. with your friends like why is that that's not going to affect my thing but then on the like seeing it from a different light and look working in loads of different schools the the school I went to were like pedantic about your hair touching your eyebrows and touching your collar and like would have like meetings with your parents over it and things because they were having the arguments about that the the big thing where like the missing classes and swearing at teachers and all that didn't yeah. never ever happened Absolutely. because like they were focusing on like petty little things 100%. and then 
And when I've worked in other schools, which ignore the petty little things, yeah. they've then got massive problems where yeah, yeah. you've got kids like, you know, doing a lot of lots worse. So like you see it from a different point of view. You so. definitely need control. You, you can't, you, you've got to have, you know, a lot of like, for example, to run a series like the British Superbikes at that level, if you look at that, the professionalism that's involved there, oh, I... but they're actually running it on very low staff. Yeah. If you think about it, so if, if, when you know, so to achieve that, a lot of the staff are volunteers, volunteers, as well. uh-huh. so, and, and so you go, you 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 drum that down, and you just think that's an amazing job. So as much as that, some of the cultures that are there are, you know, are, I don't agree with. Yeah. The point is, if you stand back, you have to one hundred percent good credit. Like you said, if the school results are there, and the BSB top championship is head and shoulders above, you know, almost anything else in the world. You I mean, even you compare it to all Superbike, it's still. That the vibe you get there is probably more than if you go to a World Superbike round at another country. So it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But the flip side is it's where you are, if you know mm-hmm. where you are is that in that moment. And I think there's a compromise. Yeah. Like there's a, definitely a middle ground. Oh, and I think it's also the way, like if you were from a teacher's point of view approaching that student, you would, there's multiple ways of doing that. And that definitely had deteriorated because I've done the same thing. I mean, the other thing that cracked me was we we're having all this through the weekend because I wrote all the, all the sessions, you know, while we're having this sort of ongoing debate and getting caught up and everyone's hearing stories. But I had a Facebook, which was social media, I had a Facebook memory come up and I was at Knock Hill like that same weekend for like the past six years. And I'm like, would I be holidaying at Knock Hill for the last six years of my life at this, you know, in the middle of summer? And the answer probably would be no. As much as I don't dislike the racetrack, it's unlikely I'd be there. And then that was the same. So I'd been following that circus for a long time and not going nowhere, you know, but that on a bad weekend, and then obviously with all those other factors and just being a bit logical, like getting the racer taken out of you, but mm. just sort of made me think. And then obviously the week after when, you know, either not having to pay the bill, if you know what I mean, that was coming up or then yeah. cashing out. It just made it such an easy decision. Mm. Not, but then I want to go road racing again. Yeah. That's not, the thing. We, looking back at you, happy you kind of made that decision then and like, yeah, I think you, I think everyone wants like a victory lap or something like that. I think that's the way you, you, you want to put a bow on it, don't you? Yeah. You look at like someone like Shane, you know, I think that's such a travesty that he didn't get that final year. And he, but, but then again, you flip it on his, on the other side and you think, well, he would have just kept going, you know, Shane, he's, he's, if other than his injuries, probably still physically fits enough to ride a motorbike. You know what Definitely, I mean? So yeah. be running for championships. Yeah, absolutely. And and this this age thing's also you know changed. I had arm pump surgery after I finished a BSB, and because of the classic bikes, I couldn't ride them with my arm. And then I realised I was actually holding myself back because I wasn't having that because I was scared to have it. And this and that. Whereas when I had nothing left, things changed and I actually got a bit better mm-hmm. at, at even riding or you know on on a different motorbike. I didn't go back and test myself on the same bikes, but. It, yeah, stuff moved on, and and you realise that, yeah, you want something different, but you don't. Know, I mean, if you look at Rossi, he had, a, you know, he would want to have won the tenth championship, but he doesn't. I'm sure he's happy he won none. Yeah. But the point is, he still. So we all want something a bit more. Yes, it's very different from it's a sportsman. Nature, that, isn't it, though? Yeah, I think pro we call ourselves pro sportsmen. That's you always want that, don't you? I've watched you watch the the Brody, you know, scenario on on you know the way he's done the NFL. He's doing another year at forty odd years old. So all of that stuff, you can see that. You don't want to let it go until, and but then will you go out and right away? Yeah. Now I, I know loads of people will be tuning in this for this purely for free tech, <laughs> like all the people oh, on the free tech page, 100%. and they'll be like, the we we're, we're in, we're one hour forty six in and oh. hardly been mentioned about free tech. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to quickly close it off? With obviously, this, yeah. you, you, yeah, it's shite. Let's skip it there. <laughs> yeah. you, you've you've brought the, this idea over to the UK, and it's yeah. been a phenomenon. It's like yeah. mass. It's so popular. Uh, really good, big following. Sure. Uh, do you want to give a quick sort of uh, um, round off of like what? Yeah. what the championship is and like how, I know you've got new classes for this year as yeah well. for sure I mean basically we just born off the back of that doing a bit of classic racing and literally just sitting there applying the same logic how do we how do we condense all the cost it's almost impossible to do on a big bike with the way things are structured at the moment but on smaller CCs it was possible we helped run some endurance races out in South Africa where we used to take foreign riders you know riders from Europe and, and encourage them to come out and then we, you know we got opportunity before COVID started to to do that, or well, I started the series, we wrote the rules. And the biggest problem was you didn't, there were no bikes, there were no race bikes. So you started race series, unless you have a, and there's, no, there's, this series is about a road bike being converted, which sounds easy, but when you start converting one, there's a lot of crap on them, you know, even though they're one, two, five. So basically, you can build a bike for as little as a thousand pounds, maybe less, and um, still be competitive. And there's a, there's a class this year which ensures that with production. 
So you literally, as it came out, you'd have to change tires. But the stuff isn't junky running. Moto3 slicks on the on the thing, or Moto3 wets, of course, we have a few you wet races. You, you can't outpower you, these tires. That's, yeah, that's, how that's the beauty of it. it. Yeah, and they don't wear out. So you suddenly your tire balls <laughs> zero, you know, or you can get 50 quid scrubs. And they, we did 18 hours on a set of slicks, and they, they still did a couple of practices after that in the 24 hours. So, and did, and I, we did our fastest laps at the end, you know, when the sun came back up mm -hmm. after that. So lo loads of... Um, loads of stuff like that basically just keeps the cost down and it's not a it's not an anti big bike scenario because the biggest problem is trying to convert big bike riders to do this but the beauty of it is it gives everyone from a youngster who's sort of needs laps to become the next you know uh, 250 champion moto 3 champion um or talent cup laps because they, they're affordable laps he gives them a chance and it gives someone that's the other end of the scale obviously someone like me who's x racer but all the way up to a road bike rider who just wants to come race and, and can't afford to throw his chicks a thousand down the road, even if it's a five year old bike. And it allows all of those guys to do that. The thing we only you have problems because everyone thinks they can ride a one to five the same speed as someone else, even if it's the same bike. And you start to realize that you have to really pedal those. And you boys have both raced them and both done well. But there's little differences when you're riding and you think, oh shit, I mean, I was behind Chrissy a few years ago at Mallory and he was doing things that I wasn't doing. And then I don't know if I passed him. He learned anything of me, but I'd and we'd sort of battled for a few laps in in the rain. And if you, and then you kind of get someone else who's you know who's who's doing who might be slower but doing something better in another area. And it's it, you can ride the bikes to your full potential. And then we we ride everything from the really decent go kart tracks right up to your big tracks like your Pembrys, Mallory's, and we're looking to expand it even more. But yeah, we we and we also do the only we we have done and we'll carry we've got another one this year the 24 race which is the only 24 hour race ever held in the UK I was about to say that was based in Teesside wasn't it and again it'll be there we, we're looking at other venues in the future maybe Isle of Man stuff like that so there's lots Jesus. of options they'll be good yeah we Free nearly did that this tour. year and then we, we're also talking about doing a Spanish round so there's there's, there's evolution of like Andalusia and, and stuff like that that we might go to so there's because we've done Africa before that would be unbelievable that absolutely um, yeah that's that's on the card so I'll tell you what would be mega you've just mentioned Andalusia yeah. but you know the when they join Almeria and Andalusia yeah. so yeah. it's like a, how big's the lap oh, it's, it's like, huge yeah. it's like, like about a six mile lap or something yeah, it's the biggest far. it's biggest sh short circuit in yeah. uh, Europe probably yeah. it's huge wow and, uh, yeah that would be absolutely get uh, get on the phone to Kev he yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no well we're really we're, all these things are uh, in at, the pipe in the pipeline so we're, we're always working away with it and and the other ethos is that obviously anyone new that's watching that you know you guys have been there we we, we try and do a bit of old school stuff few beers afterwards and, and just take the edge off but also promotional you know, ladies the, yeah we, the thing, of the, past, say, thing yeah. of the past yeah we we, we, we have um, we, we, we've not <laughs> ashamed stick in, that stick in the tradition yeah. well she's back don't worry she's back at the next round we, we, we're, not, we're not afraid to have a few promotional ladies and then if, if they're happy to come along you know, and, and More promote our event yeah. then we, we're happy to, to do, and, and I'll, I'll tell you now it's a lot better having one well, of them start the race than one of these race officials <laughs> That was, that was chaos, that Mallory one. That Mallory was, was yeah, well, really, because we left it to a race official. See, they let them blow a whistle and everyone went mad. Oh, no, that was, that was, that, that was unreal. <laughs> that was, that was so lucky. I'll t I tell you what, even going back to the free tech, you know, for people who want to know a bit more about it, but, you know, the mad thing about, shall I say, modern, you know, like stock thousand, stock 600, anything like that. Imagine if you picked one of them bikes up, took it off the paddock stand and let go of it. That's yeah. a thousand pound bill. Absolutely. That's a thousand pound, like clip on, lever clutch lever fair and damage everything that's a thousand pound you chuck one of these free techs at the scenery you pick it up you dust it off <laughs> you fire it up again and go and it totally takes away the financial zero. fear of it yeah. and, the, and the good thing is now fundamentally if you went and bought a one two five you'd only want to race it at your events yeah, yeah sure. that is that's the truth. If you went out by yourself on that bike, it would yeah. be shit. Absolutely. You know, it would be. Absolutely. There'd, be there'd be no two ways about it. Going, I've just wasted my money. But yeah. when you've got how many competitors? Well, we, we last round we had 80 guys, but on the short tracks we have 50 or 60. So it's a lot around. And then we have 100 at some of the big tracks. So. That 100, no, yeah. imagine 100 people doing the same speed. Yeah. You are nearly, you're just smiling for like hours and hours on end and you just Absolutely. get the, constantly this rivalry and it's, I can't recommend it high enough. And like you say, you just get the huge range from like the Chrissy Rouse, the Tim and Tom Neves, and yeah. you get the super bike lads. You You're learning off everyone. And and it gives the average person, you know, to connectivity to that because they won't be able to even last two corners behind you boys if, if you don't ride with one hand behind your back. You know what I mean? And obviously on, on a big bike, but obviously they're not that they are a lot closer, but they get a look in and then they go down the next straight if your bikes are the same. The same speed as you, you know what I mean, and 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 it's not when you're with each other, it's not slow. You know what I mean? No, it's good. No, so, no. But when, when you, if you're riding on your own, you'd be like, "This is pain trying." But to be fair, I don't like even riding big bikes on my own. I 
prefer riding, you know, in, in a, a group, in a pack. Yeah, I don't, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, but you could go like, you know, like, Absolutely. yeah, oh, it's totally different. But like you say, the, the, yeah. the range that you like to live is phenomenal. And it's a case of if it doesn't clash, me and him are jumping straight on yeah. the spot. Well, we've got, we've got like a, a like I said, like a, a promo bike and a, a rental bike that we try and get people in. So we, we try and do everything we can to make motor racing accessible. That's the goal. That's, but like I said, it caters for everyone from youngsters that have just won some laps that, you know, come along and, and literally kick my ass by seconds a lap on a motorbike that some ex BSB lads are saying, well, we don't think our bikes is good. These lads have gone and gone two, three seconds a lap faster, you know? So that's a great side. And then you get everyone in the middle that races at club racing. There's loads of other stuff, but it's affordable laps. That's the biggest challenge we have in it, whether you're a pro, pro rider or, or a club rider or trying to get into racing, where do you go where it's not going to cost you a fortune to do a, you know, a track day or something? You know, we, I think our events are something like 70 quid a rider, something ends up that's 70, 70 quid, quid to, and, you know, part of your share would be 70 quid. And then you're probably using 20 liters, 20 liters of fuel and a set of 50 quid tires. And you might treat yourself to a new set of brake pads for 12 quid. And, be, and bear in mind, <laughs> and that, that, that's what I mean though. And bear in mind, this is a Honda. You could literally yeah. pull it, go race and not give a flying shite about it. Park it up in the shed and go, oh, I've got a gap on the calendar. Yeah. They are that robust of motorcycles. I think... It, I can't recommend your racing enough. Mm-hmm. And bikes set on fire. There's loads of beer. <laughs> there's fireworks at the end of the event. Yeah. It's, it's we try and do a little bit of everything, but, other than we're trying to stop the guys from seeing their bikes on fire when they're on the track. But that, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 I've just thought, been thinking about this just a second ago. It'll be going out on the Sunday after the first BSB round, so I think a lot of people will probably be tuning in. So yeah. I've expected all BSB. It, it, it will catch up after like the following week. But um, obviously, it's uh, it's been a long off season and really looking forward to the first round, like proper buzzing. We've both been out on bikes recently. Uh, there was the BSB test last well, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I think. Wednesday, you were down in Silverstone, weren't you? Down in Silverstone, and yeah. uh, you, you've been. Out, do you want to talk about like being out f- for your maiden run? On the on the oh, uh, darling, more eyes. So it's uh, no, just got the BM out, and I tell you what, on the Saturday I was riding a forty brake horsepower Honda K four, hopped on that thing. I shit myself. There's no two ways about it, but it is a phenomenal bike. Fast race track as well. Fast. It did. Well, yeah, yeah, darling, more to yeah. miniature northwest, isn't it? And I was out on them um, standard pads and stuff like that, and I'm just going into turn one, going stop, 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 stop. But it was. Uh, I, I tell you what, I do love them bikes, but it just shows the the level and. The skill set that you, that you need to, to ride so one sharp. of them properly, yeah. you know, and it's um, like in the last couple, like over the last two years, I've only been on a big bike twice. Mm. You know what I mean? But that was with the DC lads. And I'm very grateful for what they did there, but it, you need that repetition. Yeah, and it's a bit like it's all that. about laps. You got to build all the way. Like that's the testing that well, both of you don't know. But Chrissy's been at that high level. We had Brent Heron uh, come yeah, yeah, come, ri- come ride with us, and you know, so and you just come off the test and was you could see little differences you can yeah, see his razor off. sharp you know what yeah, i mean and, yeah. but it's all because they've been building and that big bike stuff you have to be don't you like you saw today it's yeah that, that, blowing. that's exactly it and it's like uh, being able to go on to that but it just shows like like you were just saying that that edge and what what you've been doing has been phenomenal because that's actually like going to your test now that's your second time on the bike you know, on the super bike. So yeah. how, how are you finding that then? You know, yeah, like, look, you know jumping like, from like that say, level. W- when people listen to this, it'll be after the first round, so it'll be a little sort of slightly <laughs> outdated. Yeah, people like, a waste of time. The, uh, the test, yeah, the test went uh, a good couple of days. It was mega windy on the second day. Uh, f- first time I've ridden in winds that strong for a long time, but where, like, soon as the wheel picks up, yeah. it, like, blows Did it Did someone the side. get knocked off? Uh, there was, yeah, there was a Co- fet- Coops was telling me was- someone got knocked off. The wind, yeah, oh yeah, it was like, like as you were going like into the Cape Town wind. I was telling you guys, about. it was That's full like, on yeah, like yeah, moving your, yeah, it was it yeah. was horrendous. If you were following people down the street, everyone was leaning left going down the, the straight. But Shut then when you got to the bridge, obviously that there was yeah, no stops. wind, yeah, you, so you started yeah, actually turning yeah, left. Yeah. It was yeah, it was yeah. Uh, very bad. But um, yeah, overall, I thought the test was good. Uh, to, just a few quick mentions. Mc, uh, T- Tara McKenzie had a massive, yeah. massive high side to the last corner. It was absolutely horrendous. Just stepped off the curb. You just no, I've actually seen pictures. It was. High side through the last yeah, corner, yeah, and yeah, yeah. then it like flicked him over the front. Caught it, and then he went again, didn't it? Yeah, it was like yeah. twice as big. But um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely massive crash, and uh, hurt himself again. So uh, sending our best wishes to town. I'm sure he'll he'll be back fit very soon. He's he's a he's a special lad. So yeah, when he class. was when he was very young, he used to come ride these small bucks with us all over, and and you could see. I mean, Taylor was also good, but yeah. Taryn was younger and like 
faster. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome. He's always fast. Um, also, people who were kind of going well, it was actually G- uh, Tommy Bridewell who topped the overall test, and um, other sort of except other people that did well, the OMG lads, both really competitive. They I are think they were top, them Yamahas. top four. Um, also, that's so a championship winning bike from last year. I was reliably told by Steve Rogers they bought yes. the bike. From yes, uh, yes. Jason's or Tez's, but they bought one of them. Uh, Eden was also going well, and that's uh, Silverstone Nationals, uh, very much a Suzuki track. Mm. Um, I think Danny Kent had COVID. Yeah, COVID, yeah. Uh, so right. he missed the test, but he'll be right up the shot. I think the Suzuki should be better than it has been. You know, there's lots of reasons why Tony down the road, but that, that bike's developed. So, you know, there's tracks where, you know, you know, we're talking about the difference between bikes before, but that bike's in the window, which, yeah. if it's working, should be there. Yeah, yeah, it's mega, right? Especially at that, that track, and there's a few more uh, that it sort of does well at. But yeah, definitely, historically, it's done very well there anyway. Um, is, there, is there any, like, new tyres coming in? Because I saw on the No Limits um, Endurance, it brought so, out a, a Pirelli so 3. Sizes. There's Ooh, some I mean, sizes, sorry, so it's compounds. We've, yeah, we've got a new SCX tyre. Which now. is softer. Yeah, which is even softer than the one Jesus. before. Now, it's not a <laughs> Applicable at Silverstone because Silverstone tears up tires there in Thruxton, so everyone has to run the zero tire there, so it mm-hmm. doesn't make any difference. But um, you everywhere else, you can that. run the. If it's warm, you could probably get into a window at a, at a track which is rubbered and, you know, yeah. maybe not round one. But That's, that's yeah. one thing I need to learn mo- a lot more about because I've got no experience with choosing compounds and stuff, but I'm, I'm reliably informed that most people ran the X for race distance last year. However, at the Silverstone test, I'm, uh, most people will say, I'd, I wasn't Too running cold. the X, but yeah. I was, most people will say, and they were getting like sort of five, six laps yeah, and then it was cool. shredded. So that'll be, yeah, that's like another factor that um, when you go from super stock to super bike, it's like a new thing that you have to work yeah. out for yourself. It's phenomenal what tyres can do to this game because like a lot of people won't even know that like the hotter it goes, the softer yeah. you go and then the yeah. colder it is, the harder you go and you think, wait, wait, Well, we were saying there? before there how like us as riders, we, we get drawn into that and then we focus it after the race with yeah. people asking us questions, but it's something you almost need to know before the race, but you're so... Yeah, you know, was, um, after a test, you become technical. But it also, uh, Skinner was really impressive. He was, uh, Rory flying. was flying, and also Josh Owens was uh, uh, doing exceptionally well. Mm. I'm not sure where he finished overall, but he was um, like definitely seems to have made a, a step from. Last That's year. the next generation again coming. If you know what I mean, like yeah, it's yeah, getting stacked at the top. Young lads, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, obviously, Sykes came back, and Leon Haslam both mm. from uh, World Superbikes. I think Haslam was somewhere near the top of the sheets. Yeah, so Sykes was, was a little bit off. Known, yeah. um, um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure come race day. But it's close awesome. around that track. It's it's a tough one to yeah. call. I mean, I was I was sure. twenty. To, I was twenty first overall, and I was less than nine tenths off, like eight. So I was really like zero point eight nine eight off. So what do you? Because so you, like, you've just done that, yeah. turning the tables on you. What do you need? What do you think you'd need to make that step? Obviously, I'm not trying to say you're not going to blow them away by point eight of a second. Yeah, well, to be fair, at... all the times were massively off. So I'm expect I would expect everyone to be a lot faster yeah. if the weather's a little bit better. I would expect, but Obviously, it's, it's a fair comparison because you're on the track yeah. at the same time. And uh, I mean, obviously, there's there's areas where I can improve this a bit, bit yeah, yeah. that we can get but more of a package. Bike. To you and but the ov- overall, I would say I'm just um, slowly kind of building into it and not, uh, I'm not being greedy in terms of like br- pushing the front, lean angle, like accelerating really hard on the edge of the mm. tyre. I'm almost kind of starting off with what I would do with a super stock tire and then just very every single session i was going out i was just kind of asking a tiny bit more mm. tiny bit more a couple of times like saying to turn one the front started to tuck and yeah, i sort yeah. of saved it on my knee and then you think to yourself okay that's that's where that is and then it's just tiny little bits but yeah and that's kind of how i'm starting the the season and by that i mean the, the you first just don't want any dramas rounds. when you, when you that thing, yeah you, got, you yeah. just want to chip away and then like you say that one's always going to feel hopefully better because you're close by yeah it's the longer tracks where you, you want to still stay in that bracket and yeah. then if you build to that to be honest out. the first race weekend in terms of like i've got no experience i did a long run itself and i ended up getting like 22 23 laps in but town red flagged the session <laughs> so i didn't actually do a full Ranger race, race distance yeah <laughs> but um I'd, i've got no experience doing a full race yeah. distance on them tires on that bike so it, it's going to be a huge learning curve obviously like i say when people are listening to this it's going to be after the I know, first it's round backwards anyway, thinking but, this but I, am, great. I am uh, very yeah. much looking forward so, to it when you next out same weekend as you so Melville it's already come and gone so hopefully it's gone mid yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully he reminds me of Marty McFly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nike trainers the job lot. you want the big bike there as well yeah just the big bike trying to get I'm trying to just get as much track time as, as I can I'm desperate for it absolutely desperate for it but I'll tell you what I'm going to add a little things add a little thing to the show go on. I want everyone to pick a rider of the week no no a rider of the week it doesn't matter how a performance no nothing who's outstood this week Even, gone by. Just yeah, this about, week yeah. gone by. You know, before. 
I think um, best, best is uh, Inye from the MotoGP now, I think, for winning that. He's for me. Sorry yeah. to jump Right, on. there we Stealing are. No, no. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Good. Um, I would say Bautista uh, being off the boil on the Honda for for a good few years yeah, now and then cool. returned and well, I haven't even mentioned World Superbikes yeah, yeah. but yeah uh, to we haven't even watched that yet so great, we'll have to bring yeah. that up to take right, so, uh, yeah to come back and be back right at the front you know battling for the race wins what about you John? It's got to be 100% Stephen Parsons you, if you haven't heard of him, he's a man. Yep. He's won a Manx Grand Prix, right? Yeah. And he's just been battling le- leukemia okay. for a couple of years, and he's back. And he's only got a handful of weeks to get his mountain course license to go. He's riding for the Wilcox Racing Team on a BMW Gen Three, his own six hundred. The, la- the lad is like he's he's been approved medically to go racing again, but the determination that lad he was chasing Richard Cooper around at Darley Moor. This weekend, you know, don't get me wrong. Richard was, you know, yeah, yeah. Richard Rich is, Rich is on fire at the moment. That's what Richard has been riding away. He did a Mallory race. He's, there you are, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, you know, so um, pa- you know, Parsons in second at Darley. You know, you just think, you know what? There's a man who's the liver embodiment that he. Yeah. Life is too short. He's, he's gone. He's mm. dragged himself through hell, and he, he's gotten the other side of it. And gone. You know what? I love bikes. I want to go racing. And not. And <laughs> that's that, what he said. That's yeah, it yeah, though. Yeah, and yeah. he's not just going. I want to make up the numbers. He's, yeah. he's, Man, let's go racing. Yeah, that's yeah. it. So my rider of the week is a hundred percent Stephen Parsons. A hundred percent. I'm just having a quick look at the World Super Bikes. I haven't actually had a chance to watch the racing, but I've sort of seen a few of the results. Uh, top three from. Uh, can I uh, can I go for it? Or you go for it. No, yeah. Go for it. Uh, just so pull first it race, uh, Jonathan so. Ray Bautista in top rack. The Super Pole race, Bautista, J- uh, Jonathan Ray, and top rack. And then race two, Bautista, Jonathan Ray, top rack. So oh, top call, rack. Yeah, I wonder who. Yeah, yeah. I and wonder. then so championships looking: Bautista fifty-seven, Jonathan Ray fifty-four. So really tied. Top rack thirty-nine, bit of a jump. And then Rinaldi. Then both Honda riders. So so Honda have been miles yeah, off, yeah. And, and they're closing the gap now. They, yeah. they, both of them lads have came from MotoGP, haven't they? Mm. And it was a sort of uh, um, a big, big change in the team. But that's obviously looking like it's p- paying off and uh, fair play to them. And a big sort of, um, I know we've been talking about it a lot over the off season. Scott Redden, very sort of. He was fifteenth in one of the races. I saw that. So that was his best Jesus result around. You, so he's, he's he's on one point. And with what he's 18th. capable of as a rider, um, you know what I mean? Not gelling. Actually, yeah. I'm not clicking yet. And uh, Loris Baz is actually the highest BMW rider in ninth at the moment. Um, and I'm just quickly looking through. Well, they said the they said the Ducati was blowing past the Kawasaki. Well, I saw it was going past the Kawasaki. That's with Bautista on, to be fair. Yeah, he's, he's like only major. he's only a little. Yeah, he's time. the fastest bike, so, and... <laughs> like, you know, so it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, just to wrap things up, we've got a quick a Patreon question. Jesse Mortimer, is there anywhere other than eBay or Gumtree that I can pick up a bike for the 125 endurance race? Also, on that note, what would <laughs> you suggest is the best bike to start with? I think, you know, the, the best, you guys have both rode uh, Hondas before and, you, yeah. you know, they, they do the job. At the moment, there's a bit of a swing towards the Suzuki's, but they just dare it to bike because they're newer bikes. Okay. The Hondas are more affordable and then you can go from there and the Honda gives you lots of options. So, Honda, for me, the CBR 125 carburetor or injection do the same job. Where's there the best place to get one? Uh, just look around. I mean, the thing is, if you, you go to a car park at like behind the Sainsbury's, there'll be someone <laughs> riding around. Just push them off. I think. I think it, you sort of Facebook Marketplace. The only problem with with the one two five is they've generally not been washed. So the older they are, yeah. Yeah. they're probably the more rust that's on them. Yeah. So you just got if you buy a cheap one that's full of rust, you just got to accept that you need to have some mechanical knowledge to be able to loosen rusty bolts because every one of them is going to be rusty. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem. We've got one off Ryan Gar side. Quick fire questions. He's a huge cheat at your event. You'd really like him. <laughs> <laughs> You'd love to be saying that. Yeah, 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 we get on. We, yeah, we, 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 we get on well half at the at the pub afterwards. He was about to say. <laughs> he always gets the whole shot. At yeah, your events, yeah. If you, somehow, if you haven't noticed. Yeah, somehow. Uh, so you'll be watching quick, this going. You bet. Like yeah, had yeah. to allow him to push on his bike last time. I mean, if you watch the start, we've got a clip of it. He has to go down the pit wall, and he he begged for that. And I said, you can't have that again. You know what I mean? Nearly ran three people over. The, we anyway. rode for him at the last one. He's yeah. a fella, uh, mate. So quick fire questions. One of the other no half answers. So left or right. What do you say? Uh, so it's one or the other. You've just got to say oh, one left or right. Yeah. Right. Interpret it how you like. Yeah, so. right. Uh, super stock or super sport? Uh, super stock. Suzuki or Honda? Suzuki. Cricket or rugby? Rugby. South Africa or Ashby de la Zouche? Oh, Ashby de la Zouche. No, I'd say that, yeah. yeah. Ashby de la Zouche, yeah. Uh, Brad Binder, Darren Binder? Uh, Brad. And time travel or invisibility? <laughs> time travel. Chrissy uh, or Dom? Uh, <laughs> that was actually the question. Was, was, it? was it? Was it really? Yeah. I want to say both at the same yeah, time. Both. I would have said Chrissy. I was personally going to say both. I want to say both at the same time, just like twins. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, uh, and he's just put long live the no insurance endurance. So, no, no, we're, we're doing a great job. Mid, now, just before mid. we wrap up, uh, just a quick one <laughs> that uh, we've just done. A, we've recently done a collaboration with Bennett's, and we're we'll so throughout this. Have you could not tell year, by a yeah, shirt? Sure, yeah, they throughout are. the year, we're going to have like. Um, a lot of like sort of giveaways and stuff and so with the podcast obviously the the title sponsor for the british shooter bike so there's a, lot, a big tie in there they're, all, they're also sponsoring i think it's the lightweight tt or it's yes. one, one of the tts they're sponsoring so they're going to have yep. uh, you the know classes, cool cool yeah, things yeah. that we can uh, link up with there and they're obviously do track days at the bsb do loads of things with customers and stuff like yeah. the experience days yeah, and yeah. stuff so um yeah looking for i'm hoping that'll be a good way of like sort of giving our listeners something back absolutely be, uh, we know to do that i mean they do their days i've been to a few of, of mega you know, i mean the next level so if you guys can offer that through them it's, it's really good for your listeners now, other than uh, the obviously the free tech um series if yeah. you like that uh, you look after is there anything else that you're kind of involved with or promoting or anything at nah, the moment just i mean for me that that was the the, the main thing to, to sort of kill obviously we've been through a funny couple of years you know mm. and we've been able to to keep racing a lot of the time when, when we were allowed to legally so that helped us a lot but uh, it's kept me sane this is one you know and, and I showed you boys the garage earlier, but there's a shed at the That's back right. which is full of filings, which is all where the, the grinding happens, shall we say, or the loosening of the rusty bolts. <laughs> <laughs> scrap when, man's coming it, around later. Exactly. Well, there was a script here not too long ago. So, yeah, it's it's that sort of stuff. That's all. You know, and you sometimes think you're all before your time, but it's sometimes a simple thing. So that keeps me happy. But I have looked at, you know, doing other stuff. Maybe I want to do look at that European classic racing. That's sort of open up to 92, so ZX7s. OWOs, oh. RC30 is a bit out of my price range, but that's some sort of two bikes that were just before my time. But you know, that's also a great, great little series, which is Mint. They, and they're going to ride at cool tracks, Le Mans, Spa, you know, this nice, yeah, and nice, nice bars. Spa. Right. That, that sounds like right up your well. We, we might do it, just touching on that because of Spa, we might there's a mega go a short track in the middle of Spa. So, we again, we're looking at putting a race on there. So, oh yeah, my God, but Samuel. I, I want to go to Spa. Anyway, you know what I mean? Just to ride the big track. But yeah. we any excuse to go is my point. That's what I'm you trying sound to do. Like so set up an event around it, clever some, thing, and uh, get around especially the Especially the I'm loving the uh, Spain idea of the free yeah. tech in Spain and I, th- but, I think that would be carnage. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah but a warm when it's a bit cool, yeah. That's the idea. Definitely. Yeah. And uh just before we wrap things up, I just want to quickly mention that um a while ago my a good friend of mine, Lundy, who kitted this fan out, uh, suggested that we went uh, skydiving and uh, sort yes. of pushed us into it. Yeah. And uh, I decided so ages ago we're booked to do our AFF course and uh, did our training a few months ago did a refresh the other day and uh, today there was the first time I actually got a jump out the plane so we did uh, well I got three jumps in I think he got four jumps and um, yeah I had did to- you land yeah, had to take these off before because obviously your ears pop yeah, like yeah. loads and stuff and yeah. like you're trying to um, you know trying to come back to it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, what it was easily one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. It was absolutely incredible. It's a buzz in it. It's I'm still, bu- I'm still like wired off it now. And when I came, like the instructor, um, <laughs> one of them like flew in front of us and he just when we got back he was like laughing with all of his mates because he said he kind of like f- we jumped out the plane and you accelerate to like over 100 mile an hour flying through the air and he went in front of us and i just had like the biggest smile on my face the, in the cheeks world. left flipping away yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it was absolutely amazing and that the the thing when you when you decide to pull so like six thousand feet you pull and obviously there's that big deceleration and then it's just blissfully peaceful quiet Floating. you just you can see right out the north sea you can see for miles all over the country spot things and you've just got about like five say five minutes of just peaceful just so beautiful and uh, honestly i can't recommend it highly enough uh, for anyone that if anyone gets a chance to do once it. once a kick yeah, yeah a kick of adrenaline oh yeah, it's yeah unreal yeah. you've already done yeah, i've, I've done, done six time. solo jumps yeah. yeah 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 so i've done a lot of like base jumping off of stuff like in Cape Town there's I'd a few peaks where you jump and you float down so it's yeah. I want to do base jumping yeah, that, just, that would be a quite, rush because it's, it's a cool. lot yeah. lower it's that like do you know when it takes your breath away and it's like just that yeah, it's yeah. like a feeling that you it's I, I guess it'll probably end up being like a bit of an addiction but yeah no it's just what's the same it's, you're getting the same kicks on you that's the yeah when you've raced motorcycles or done scary stuff you you sort of you, you need it you need a kick every yeah, yeah, and exactly. John, John Hopkins's boogie got into the 
um, I think it's base jumping, but yeah, with base, the suits. Yeah. Have you seen that? The wings. Yeah, the wings are flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, but that. I mean, that's like, yeah. That's, again, it's like Absolutely. another level, yeah. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> unreal. Anyway, I've, uh, have you got anything else to wrap up? Um, yeah, I've actually got to say a massive shout out to one of our listeners, Simon Carter, and uh, Jason Griffiths there, you know, from the Metzler family of the mm, Prelly. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've actually, I'm, I'm on board with them for the, for the Rhodes campaign this nice. year. So I must say thank you very much to them lads and uh, getting some support from that end of it. So Jason's always been a big, I mean, he used to race, obviously. The oh, God, was, I, that's and it. He was someone else that I watched before, you know, but, mm. but like when I was talking about it. But yeah, he's, he's, and it's great to see him. He's always put back in, isn't he? He's always been in, 100%, in part and he, of that. He's a very busy man because we want to try and get him on the show one day. He's he's agreed to come on the show and yeah. say, just trying to tie him down when that's he's not that. busy, which, well, that's it, you know, looking after everyone in the BSB paddock. It's a, it's a full time babysitting gig, isn't it? Let's face it. There you go. But um, no, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it because I've never done the Isle of Man on. Um, on Metzers before. It's more now, stable than the, than the other brands. That's the one advantage. That's it, because I've always gone around in the Dunlops, um, mm. just where they always guaranteed a six-lap tyre, and yeah, that's yeah. where I went down that route. Yeah. So and I tell Saving you, money. I like it. Well, well, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, Christ, oh, Christ, oh, Christ, oh, Christ oh. So, <laughs> What did you do, TTM? Uh, what, tyres? I did. I swapped them. The Triumph, I had to run on the Metzlers or Pirellis, because, well, Metzlers, they didn't, Metzler was a tyre, because yeah. it would shake too much on the Dunlops. You could, literally couldn't ride a Triumph on Dunlops. Tried to. And the big bikes, I used both. Dunlop lasted a bit better. The Pirellis or Metzlers were always more stable. Yeah. So it was whatever. If you're physically fitter, you could get away with the Dunlops. But, um, yeah, the, the Pirelli gave you an easier ride. But, yeah, you just have to choose. But we would pit on the Metzlers. We, yeah. we, we would always change tyres. I think my best results were probably on the Metzler. There we are then. Yeah. So exactly. Like the two tires, they're very close now. There's like if you look the but look the with Dean Harrison line. and my, yeah. uh, Dean Harrison, Pete Hickman. You know, there's Dean Harrison flying think, around at nearly Hutch, a one thirty five. And... Hutchie's done the same amount of wins on both. Both though, yeah. yeah. There used to be a time when I think the Dunlop we just had the you know they had the outright pace. It might yes. have been easier for a someone like a newcomer like me at the time to ride on a different tire. But the outright pace to do that lap time, you would have needed a Dunlop. But definitely the other boys have updated. I even raced around there on Michelin's. Right. Yep. Try them. They, they came, came on board. Same as you. Also wanted to save a few quid. That was interesting. There we are. That was interesting. The term was interesting. There we go. <laughs> no, they were okay. It's just that no one yet any data. So we, you know, they were there. They were. They tried really hard, but it was. It's quite a big event to go and yeah. not develop a tire, but there's the probably twenty sort of tires to choose from. So I, t- I tell you what, I'm particularly looking forward to though seeing Dunlop. Eh, not Dunlop. Give me another name. McGuinness. Back. Eh, not when well, McGuinness is back yeah. as well as he's on Metzlers. Oh, has he changed? Okay, yeah, yeah. Because so, he's a Dunlop man. He was a, yeah. practically if you cut him in half, you'd have Dunlop written through him. So it'll be interesting. They, put a, they should have put another zero at the back of that check. He would have stayed on Dunlop. <laughs> That's it. Well, I think it's more the Honda decision element. Yeah, of it, you yeah. know. So it'll be it'll be yeah. good to see him. And then Hutchie's back. But the on bike will be set up as well, won't it? That's the other yes. thing. There's a crossover now. And the other thing is, if you think Honda before in the roads, they always had that data rolling. But now we've had this big gap where the bikes changed. Brand new bike, isn't it? And, that's, and so there's no data. So that, that was one of the big advantages they had over you know, other brands. You'd look when Norton came. At one stage, they spent a lot of money. They were trying everything, but they didn't have the, the, the sort of momentum from data. Yes. And the one bike, sort of as it moved into the next, they knew what had worked before. When the BMs came, Michael obviously got that going, but a lot of the other guys sort of struggled, but then it moved forward again. So, yeah, if the bike's got momentum, but if you set up on certain tires, it that, makes sense. That's, I tell you what, that's, gonna, that's a very interesting argument because the only person that's going there with momentum based on that is Hickman. Yeah. He's gone around there on the Dunlops on his Same. BM. Yeah. Hick, um, Harrison yeah. is making the change from Metzler's to Dunlop's this oh, year so he's got... on the ZX10 though yeah, yeah. so it's a little bit different and then Dunlop is on the Ducati a very hard chassis yeah, yeah. on Dunlop's yeah. he's that... on a Ducati for the Superbike and then he's on a Honda for Superstock that... yeah he's on a Honda for Superstock mm, isn't he and, then, he's testing, yeah. oh, okay. and Hillier and Davo you know they're on the Yamahas both on the Metzlers but you see Hillier's always been a Metzler man he's mm. he, you know it's always that. Jamie Coward's on the R1 yeah yeah uh, but that he's should been... be good the R1 I think will be good around there oh, but Jamie's done a 130 round there on those same times but mm. I tell you what speaking of air uh, out like you know we were talking about BSB outside bets we'll have to ask you that question as well but um, I tell you who's going absolutely fantastic Craig Neve yeah, yeah. and he's uh, he's seeded at number 20 um, and he's he's looking seriously strong. Nathan Harrison, he's looking strong. There's loads of people who are going to mix it up this year. It's, it's gonna, looking good. It's it going to be, it's good. Gonna be interesting because also with that break, no one's ever had that so much time away from there because all, all the top lads were going there doing the classic. They were, you yep. know, John was going over there walking his dog at times, I mean, over the mountain just to see if there's any more potholes, doing the sort of Joey thing where you, you know, put yeah, your yeah. secret markers down and all that sort of stuff. And I can tell you now, all of that helped. You know, every one that's been a newcomer there, if you didn't have that, you don't even understand how they did it before that training program existed, you know, because yeah. the track's so immense. It's just, yeah, it's like trying to do the Dakar without a, without a map. 
You know what I mean? It's, Jesus, it's be impossible. I would put it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the same, and it's so, and there's so many little tricks. Also, you know, going so far. So the fact that there's been a gap, you know, it's going to be very interesting who gets back to that speed. I'm, you know. I'm personally relying on it because, um, like I was saying before, I've been on a big bike twice in two years, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And then you think, well, we're going to the Isle of Man. I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully the Isle of Man will play its, yeah, yeah. its enigma card and go right. This is this back is the wrong, but. That's so it's how the it. week goes, isn't it? How the practice goes. Of course That's, it is. Yeah. Of course it is. But when you think you've got the lads who have been able to afford to do British for two years, that edge is going to be there. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, and like you say, the live streaming coming in and, oh, it's, it's could, a good time to be alive. Even kids. if you're having a bad day at the Isle of Man, just think of me. I was there on a bill trying to race around. Now, that makes your bad day look good. <laughs> And that's all I'm going to say about that. There you are. Simple as that. <laughs> Simple as that. Is the view you know. the one that did not fall? It had a swinging arm at the front. It had a swing. Uh, yeah, it did, I think it had a cancel. I think this one, when it eventually got there, it had normal suspension, but it, it was a it was a V, but it was a, a crazy V. So basically the problem was it, the way the engine rotated, which you didn't know until you got to the Isle of Man, was it didn't, if you lent it down at that speed, it didn't want to pick back up or vice versa. It didn't want to lean over. No so wonder no one you needed arm pump surgery. It's all from that no, one Buell ride. It was there. horrendous. And, and they were a little bit slower than They used to race in World Tour bikes. Then, yeah, it was the same bike. Um, yeah, it was the same bike. They had like this really, yeah. really uh, like a crazy passionate fan club that used to go yeah. every I think it was at Americans yeah. Yeah. And they used to go it's every brand, single yeah. World Superbike round and these two Buells would be going round yeah. last, last and second last every well, single they, race we, but the, the, the fan club were like just so passionate about them we the team Buell was obviously having its financial problems and that split that team bought the, those two Buells the, the World Superbike ones because that they stopped World Superbike like a month before the TT but we had them there but no one knew how to start them so we had them in the garage but we rode like you know, converted road bikes but the problem is they were right on the road until you try and take them to that that level and they were really cool you know for a cool factor there's lots of cool things but they just weren't up to speed for that maybe the, the proper race spec might have been different but with all the heavy stuff and the way that engine worked <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't good and then and then the engine started blowing up so i don't think we actually i, I know we, we probably went through eight engines between me and mark miller Jesus, I, mean, I was sitting. Oh, my engine's still fine. And then you know, two days Bang. later, of course, you, know, you come back and be knocking like a like a little one two five that's been revved for twenty five. <laughs> think that's not right. <laughs> something's off here. Yeah, something's not good. So yeah, there's interesting times. But yeah, think about that to make you feel better. There we go. I, t- I t- <laughs> like I tell you what. Before before we wrap up the show beautifully here, we're gonna ask who's your who's your championship favorite for the BSB. I oh, see. That's a tough one. I think short answer, Jason Halloran. I think I think doesn't want him to win it. I think he's yeah. I just think yeah. What he showed last year, if it was over a whole year, it's a definite. You know what I mean? Because he's going to develop. It's just the way that format is. They're still running the 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 showdown where that just gives everyone a a fair chance, which makes it exciting, no question. But Mm. someone who's Mister consistently fast, you know, they're all good guys, all fast. You know, no one in that whole the whole race that's not fast. But the point is, he's always going to deliver. And and the problem is, if you look at it, he just had a few rounds where there was rain and all the rest of it. And he's got an irritating part where his teammate is arguably one of the fastest riders. You know, he's just got inherent, sort of at the moment, still going through some sort of experience, crashing, you know, hopefully that comes right. You know, And also injuries. If 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 you have that sort of marquez thing where you ride right on that edge all the time, you, you've more danger, aren't you? But yeah. yeah Halloran for sure. Oh, Halloran for there. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. We've already done our picks, haven't we? Oh, I think we keep that. Uh, Who did you It's say? like fantasy, I, to be honest, mate, it keeps changing that yeah, many other times. I I I've got no, few, my opinion before is Before the testing started, I think I said, oh, Halloran for my firm favourite and yeah. Bradley Ray is my outside bet, I think. I think the other two Yamahas, for sure, you know, it, I think it's the for me, consistency-wise, the four Yamahas. Oh, no, 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 sorry, I said Leon Haslam. Oh, did you? Yeah, mm, I went see. for Le- Yeah, because can you remember I said Leon Haslam and Christian said, really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm not against the. the I mean, I was, as an old boy, I love the old boys, but I just don't. I think the the job's moved on. Now. I also no. think, um, and from this is from being out on track with them as well. I personally think Raw Skinner is going to be like mega this year. Sure. Yeah, all, I think all those. You know, the two the two OMG yams will be will be rapid because those boys they're so, so hungry, aren't they? You know what I mean? And they've yeah. now got they've got the same kits as the raceways boys, yeah. so the bikes are the same. So Brooks, uh, the four riders, Brooks, he looks well up for it as well. Yeah, I think he's got a point to prove. You yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. So so much, but yeah, I just still think those show after last year and what happened. You know, he's yeah. gonna have that little bit of fire. 
Mm-hmm. God, I hope he brings it all. Supporting the Southern Hemisphere, right? I can't be, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, Do you see that? I, that should, I should know. I mean, this I should, is how much you've sh- grown up. I should, go, I should go against them, shouldn't I? Just just my, all my training for as, as, as a schoolboy <laughs> should be it's dead just against them. Yeah, no, I'm going against everything. You're all mad about listening. <laughs> <laughs> my quality, I love it. Uh, class fan. <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, thank I've you guys one, for having me. I've, I've got, got yeah, one more shout out. Tom from Mortal is the perfect man to speak to about polishing your helmet and lubrication. Yeah. I promised him I'd shout him out there, so there he, you are, he lives, Tom. He lives around here. Yeah? Well, I've cycled with him a few times. They all come out on the road. If you go cycling around here, yeah, you bump into everyone. <laughs> There's a McKenzie down there. Tom's down there. Towers is down that way. Honestly, they're all over the shop. <laughs> the Eddie place. Roberts lives down there. If you want to get some old Pirellis from three years ago. Yeah, fantastic. Three years ago, <laughs> class, man. Absolutely class. But uh, obviously, thank you to our sponsors, Colchester Kawasaki, all our patrons. I've just nicked that line from Chrissy. I felt wrong. Can no, I feel, no, 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 Susie, this is not right. Seriously, can you finish that no, off? No, I, feel, I feel dirty. Yeah, you yeah, massive, massive, shower. massive thanks. <laughs> and, uh, uh, massive thanks for your time as well. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Cool. So, uh, and look forward to catching up at a free tech event. Yeah, so yeah we'll look forward, forward to seeing you guys there. And now we'll get off your drive. See you in a minute. Chasing the racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles.